Welcome back to J-Force English. I'm Jennifer and today I have a three hour English lesson for you. That's right. You're going to improve your English, become fluent in English in the next three hours. In this lesson, you are going to learn 300 advanced English words that will help you sound very fluent and natural in English. Let's get started. First, you're going to learn 100 phrasal verbs. Now, as you're going through this lesson, you'll complete different quizzes along the way to make sure you really know these phrasal verbs. Let's get started. Question one, the phrasal verb used to invite someone on a romantic date is... Now, I'm only going to give you three seconds for each question. So hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play to see the answer. The phrasal verb is to ask out. Question two, if you like a genre of music, you can say, I'm really country music. I'm really into country music. Remember, I'm going to explain every single phrasal verb in detail, so don't worry if this test is difficult. Number three, if a movie made you sad, you can say, that movie really me down. That movie really brought me down. Number four, if you think someone should be happier, you can say, cheer, cheer up, cheer up. Number five, do you have time to the dry cleaning on your way home? Do you have time to pick up? Number six, you see that box? Can you at the post office? Can you drop it off? Number seven, we ended up at home. We ended up staying at home. Number eight, which phrasal verb is used to reject someone or something? To turn down. Number nine, when you complete a form, you can use both fill in and fill out. This is true. Number 10, how did you that Maria was fired? How did you find out? So how did you do with that quiz? Was it easy or difficult? Share your score in the comments and now I'll explain every phrasal verb in detail with example sentences. Number one, to ask someone out. Now pay attention to the sentence structure because notice here I'm using someone. You only ask someone out. You don't ask something out. And here's the reason why. When you ask someone out, it's to invite them on a romantic evening together also known as a date. <laughs> so to ask someone out, you invite them on a date. A date is a romantic evening spent with someone. Of course, it doesn't have to be an evening. It could be a morning coffee date or an afternoon date as well. But I just said evening because most of the time it is in the evening. So let me give you an example sentence. Why hasn't Jim asked Maria out yet? He's obviously into her. So notice here, why hasn't Jim asked Maria out? Ask someone out. Our someone is Maria. Now, of course, you need the subject who's doing the action. So Jim is inviting Maria on a date. A date is always romantic, right? Now, Maria could say no, and we're going to talk about that later on in one of our phrasal verbs. So let me give you that example again. 
Why hasn't Jim asked Maria out yet? He's obviously into her. Now you might be wondering, Jennifer, what does that mean? He's obviously into her. Well, that's our next phrasal verb. To be into someone. To be into someone. Now here, I'll point out that you can also be into something. But first, let's talk about to be into someone. When you're into someone, I'm sure you notice based on the context, but it means to like someone romantically. Now, the context is really important because I'm going to give you a musician who I'm really into. I'm really into Jack Johnson. Now, when I say that, oh, I'm really into Jack Johnson, I don't like Jack Johnson romantically, although he is pretty cute, I guess, but <laughs> I don't like him romantically, but I really like his music. So if you use into someone, it depends on the context, but there is this meaning of liking. And for the most part, that liking is romantic. So if I said, Jim is into Maria, he likes her romantically. But if I'm talking about being into a celebrity or a musician, an actor, it's possible that I just like them, but not necessarily romantically. So keep that in mind. Now remember I said you could also be into something. Now in this case, we're talking about liking something and it's usually an activity or a hobby. So I was really into Jack Johnson when I was really into playing ukulele and playing guitar. Jack Johnson is an amazing musician. He plays guitar and he plays ukulele. So I was really into him and mainly when I was into playing ukulele and playing guitar. Those are two activities I don't really do much anymore simply because I don't have time. It isn't a priority for me to do those activities right now at this stage in my life. Although one day I would definitely like to do them again. Now, so you could talk about any hobby or activity. Oh, I'm really into going hiking. I'm really into playing video games. So we use this with hobbies and activities mainly. Our next phrasal verb, to bring someone down. To bring someone down is to make someone unhappy. But there's that transition because that person was happy and then something happened to bring them down and now they're not happy or they're at least less happy than they were before. So I could say that movie really brought me down. Now notice here, the, my subject is the movie. The movie brought me down. I could also use a person. My boss brought me down. So something or someone can bring someone down. That movie brought me down. So I was happy and then I watched the movie and now I'm not happy or I'm less happy. Probably because the movie was very sad or depressing, something like that. Number four, to cheer up. So you can think of this as the opposite. To cheer someone up is to make them happier. Now we commonly use this in the imperative. Cheer up. Cheer up, Julie. Cheer up. Don't be sad. Cheer up. So we commonly use this in the imperative, but you can use it in other ways. For example, I could say, I took my friend out to lunch to cheer her up, to cheer her up. So that's the reason why I wanted to make her happier, to cheer her up. Number five, to pick someone or something up. This is one of the most common phrasal verbs. You probably know it, but did you know you can also pick something up? You pick someone up and you also pick something up. And that's when you take an object or a person from one location to another location. So of course you might know it in the sense of, I pick my kids up after school 
or I pick my husband up after work. Right? That's probably how you know it. But you can use it with a something. Maybe your husband could call you and say, "Oh, hey, can you pick milk up on your way home? Can you pick milk up?" So you're going to go to a location, the store, get milk, and take it to another location, your home. Can you pick milk up? On your way home, it's very common to get a call from someone and they ask you, "Oh, hey, can you pick this up? Can you pick this up on your way home?" And that something is a grocery item or something for your home. So now you know how to use it with a someone and a something. And what's the opposite of to pick someone up? Well, it's to drop someone off. And you can also drop something off. When you drop someone or something off, it's to leave someone or something at a specific location. So of course you could say, "I drop my husband off at work." I dropped my friend off at the airport. Now you might also ask someone, "Can you drop this letter off on your way to work?" So they take the letter and they. Leave it somewhere in a different location, the post office or a mailbox. Can you drop this letter off on your way to work? Number seven, to end up. To end up is a very useful phrasal verb. We use it to say that you eventually do something or eventually decide something. So you might say, "I ended up asking Julie out." I ended up asking Julie out. Who was our first example? I can't remember. Oh, it wasn't Julie. It was Jim and Maria. So let me give that again. Jim ended up asking Maria out. So remember before I said, why hasn't Jim asked Maria out yet? So now remember to end up. That's to eventually do something. So after a period of time. So Jim ended up asking Maria out, but she turned him down. Remember, I said at the beginning, I'm going to teach you a phrasal verb. If Maria, I was going to say Julie again. If Maria says no, well, that's to turn someone down. That's our next phrasal verb to turn someone down. Now you can also turn something down. Can you think of something that you might say no to? Hmm. How about a job offer? Hmm. Something like that. So to turn someone down, to turn something down, is when you receive an invitation or a proposal to do something, and you say no, you decline, you refuse, you reject, <laughs> you say no. So Maria turned Jim down. Now you might also say, I was turned down for the job. I was turned down. Now you could turn that into an active sentence. They turned me down. I was turned down by the company. They turned me down. So in this specific phrasal verb, it is commonly used in the passive. So I would get comfortable with the passive, but you can use it in the active, of course, as well. Number nine: to fill in or to fill out forms. Okay, so notice here I gave you two prepositions. I know students get confused. What's the difference between fill in and fill out? There is no difference. So specifically with forms, that's the only time that there is no difference. When you're entering information into a form, you're filling in that form. You're also filling out that form. It doesn't matter which preposition you use, and honestly, I use both of them interchangeably. So I just change between fill in, fill out. I use both, and you can too. So if you go to an office, they might say, after you fill in this form, or after you fill out this form, 
drop it off at reception. Notice, drop it off at reception. So take it to reception and leave it there. Drop it off at reception. Our final phrasal verb, to find out. To find out is when you understand something, you learn something, or you discover something. So maybe, going back to our character Jim, so maybe Jim could say, how did you find out that Maria turned me down? So maybe Jim is a little embarrassed. He thought this was just a secret nobody knew. But then a friend tried to cheer him up because he knew Maria turned him down after he asked her out. Notice all our phrasal verbs. So Jim could say, how did you find out that Maria turned me down? So how did you discover this? How did you learn this? How did you find this out? And we use this when you want to get information as well. So I might say, I need to find out when the store closes because I have a package I need to drop off but I don't know when they close. I need to find that out. So learn or discover that specific information. So now that you understand all of these phrasal verbs, how about we do the quiz from the beginning again? And then you can compare your score from the first time to the second time. So let's do that same quiz now. Question one. The phrasal verb used to invite someone on a romantic date is... The phrasal verb is to ask out. Question two. If you like a genre of music, you can say, I'm really country music. I'm really into country music. Number three, if a movie made you sad, you can say, that movie really me down. That movie really brought me down. Number four, if you think someone should be happier, you can say, cheer, cheer up, cheer up. Number five, do you have time to the dry cleaning on your way home? Do you have time to pick up? Number six, you see that box? Can you at the post office? Can you drop it off? Number seven, we ended up at home. We ended up staying at home. Number eight, which phrasal verb is used to reject someone or something? To turn down. Number nine, when you complete a form, you can use both fill in and fill out. This is true. Number 10, how did you that Maria was fired? How did you find out? Now, if you want more support to help you feel comfortable and confident using phrasal verbs, you can join the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium membership program where we study native English speakers and you'll learn the most common phrasal verbs, idioms, and expressions. And you'll have me as your personal coach to answer any questions you have and to give you feedback. So you can look in the description for the link to join the Finally Fluent Academy today. Day. Question one, please bear me while I look up your file. Please bear with me while I look up your file. Question two, the phrasal verb to attend to means to attend to means to work on. Number three, why are you so angry? You need to cool 
You need to cool down. Number four, the phrasal verb for repair is. The phrasal verb for repair is fix up. Number five, the phrasal verb for to discuss something so you can reach an agreement is to hash out, to hash out. Number six, if someone is being too serious, you can tell them to lighten up, lighten up, you're being too serious, lighten up. Number seven, after years of studying English, my hard work has finally paid. My hard work has finally paid off. Number eight, we shouldn't rule out a graphic designer. We shouldn't rule out hiring a graphic designer. Number nine, my boss for being late again. My boss chewed me out for being late again. And number 10, let's give everyone a few minutes to before we begin. To settle in. So how did you do with that quiz? Was it easy, difficult? Share your score in the comments below. And now I'm going to explain every single phrasal verb in detail. So let's do that now. To bear with someone. This is a very common phrasal verb. It has a simple meaning. It means to be patient with someone. So we use this a lot with customer service representatives or anytime someone is providing you with a service. Now it's very common when that person is providing you with that service to say, please bear with me. Please bear with me. Please be patient. So notice our verb tense, that's in the imperative, the imperative. So we're starting with the base verb. Now, if you use this verb in other verb tenses, it's an irregular verb. The past simple is bore, and the past participle is, any idea? It's born, that's right, born, with an optional E for spelling, but pronunciation is exactly the same. In the past simple, you could say, I bore with him for 20 minutes. I was patient with him for 20 minutes. And in the past participle, you can use this in the present perfect. You might say, I've borne with you for 20 minutes. Our next phrasal verb is to attend to. Now notice we're using the verb attend. And I could say, last night I attended the party, but that's not a phrasal verb. That's just a regular verb because I don't have a preposition. I attended the party. I went to the party. But if we use the phrasal verb attend to, the meaning is different. I could say I attended to the party. Now in this case, this means that I worked on or I paid attention to the party. So how could you work on a party? Well, you could work on organizing a party. So organizing all the details, sending out the invitations, buying the food, cleaning the apartment, getting the decorations. I attended to the party. So pay attention because the verb attend and the phrasal verb attend to have different meanings. Our next phrasal verb, to cool down, to cool down. We use this when someone is really angry, upset, or frustrated, and you want them to relax. You can say, cool down, cool down. So let's say a client has been sending you a lot of emails and you're feeling really angry, irritated, annoyed, frustrated with that client. But before you call that client, you should definitely cool down. You need to take a minute 
and relax because you don't want to call that client when you're angry and frustrated and annoyed. You need to cool down, relax, chill. Our next phrasal verb, to fix something up. When you fix something up, it means you repair it or you change it in order to improve it. Now in this case, when you change it, it's not necessarily broken. It could be that it's functioning, but you want to improve it. So you make some changes to it. You fix it up. So for example, I could say Sally loves fixing up old cars in her free time fixing up old cars. So she repairs them, but it could also mean that she just changes them. Maybe the car is working perfectly, but she changes it. She changes the color or she adds something to it. She fixes it up. Now this is a very common phrasal verb around the house because there's always something to fix up, right? To change, to repair, to improve. Our next phrasal verb, to hash something out. When you hash something out, it means you talk about something specific with other people, and you do that because you want to get agreement. You want to get agreement on the details. So you can use this when you're planning a conference, planning a party, planning a project, any kind of event. And of course, with a project or conference, there are many details, the date, the time, who's doing what. So you need to hash out those details. You need to talk about them to get agreement. Okay, we agreed to the time of the conference. We hashed it out. We hashed out the time of the conference. Our next phrasal verb, to lighten up. Now remember, I already taught you to cool down, and that's when you're really angry, frustrated, annoyed, and you want to relax. Well, when you tell someone to lighten up, you also want them to relax, but they're not angry, frustrated, or annoyed. They're just being too serious. That's it. They're being too serious. They don't have a sense of humor. So maybe you were joking around with a coworker and they took it too seriously and you just wanted to have some fun and joke around, but they're too serious. So you might say, lighten up, lighten up, laugh a little, smile a little. You're too serious. So someone who's always like this, you know, they're not smiling, they're not laughing, they're just always very serious. You might wanna tell that person to lighten up, smile, relax, laugh. But just remember, it isn't the same as cool down, because cool down, you're angry and annoyed. Lighten up, you're too serious. That's the difference between the two. Our next phrasal verb, to pay off. Now, when something pays off, it means that you see the benefit of the something. So let's say you spent the last month at home studying for a big exam, and you took the exam and you passed, you got a really high mark. You can say, all my studying paid off. So remember, something pays off. All my studying paid off. I now see the benefit of all the studying I did. So we use this a lot for any kind of work or effort that you put in. Now it can be mental work for studying for your job, but it can also be physical work as well. So all your dieting, your exercising paid off because now you lost weight, you're stronger, you see the benefit of all your work. So we can use this with both mental work and physical work. Our next phrasal verb, to rule out. We use this when something prevents something else from happening. So a classic example, we have COVID and we have traveling. Now COVID is preventing traveling from happening, right? 
So we can say COVID ruled out traveling, right? COVID prevented traveling. COVID ruled out traveling. Our next phrasal verb, to chew someone out. To chew someone out. This is when you tell someone that they've done something wrong, but you tell them angrily. So you don't tell them calm it, calmly, you know, you made a mistake, you shouldn't have done that. No, you're angry. So you might yell a little, you might use language that you normally wouldn't. You're angry, somebody did something wrong and you tell them. So maybe your boss chewed you out because you were late for an important meeting. So your boss was not calm, your boss was angry. Why were you late? You shouldn't have been late. Why haven't I fired you yet? He chews you out. Or maybe you're on a sports team and your coach chewed you out because you missed an important practice. Now, if somebody chews you out and they're really angry, what phrasal verb goes with that? Phrasal verb that we've already learned. Cool down, right? Because if somebody's angry, why were you late? You can say, cool down, cool down, relax. And then you can explain why you were late. Our final phrasal verb, to settle in. When you settle in, it means you get comfortable in a new environment. And that new environment is generally a new house, a new school, a new workplace, and of course, at the beginning, you're not comfortable just because everything is new, right? But then you need some time to settle in. So settle in just means to get comfortable in a new environment. So let's say you move to a new city, and a few weeks later, a friend could ask you, oh, have you settled in? Have you settled in? So they're just asking you, do you feel comfortable in your new city? And then you might reply back and say, yeah, I've settled in, or no, I haven't settled in yet. Now that you know how to use all of these phrasal verbs, how about we do the exact same quiz from the very beginning, and you can compare your score from the first time to this time. So let's do that quiz again now. Question one, please bear me while I look up your file. Please bear with me while I look up your file. Question two, the phrasal verb to attend to means, to attend to means to work on. Number three, why are you so angry? You need to cool, you need to cool down. Number four, the phrasal verb for repair is, the phrasal verb for repair is fix up. Number five, the phrasal verb for to discuss something so you can reach an agreement is, to hash out, to hash out. Number six, if someone is being too serious, you can tell them to lighten up, lighten up, you're being too serious, lighten up. Number seven, after years of studying English, my hard work has finally paid my hard work has finally paid off. Number eight, we shouldn't rule out a graphic designer. We shouldn't rule out hiring a graphic designer. Number nine, my boss for being late again. My boss chewed me out for being late again. And number 10, let's give everyone a few minutes to before we begin. To settle in. 
Question one, the phrasal verb used when you gradually introduce a new rule, policy, or law is? The phrasal verb is to phase in. Question two, if you want to reserve a specific time in your calendar, you can block it. You can block it off. Question three, when the fire alarm went off, everyone of the building, everyone cleared out of the building. Question four, we'll have to air conditioning this summer. We'll have to do without. Question five, if someone is removed from a position against their will, they are, they are forced out of that position. Number six, the phrasal verb used when information becomes clear in one's mind is, to sink in. Question seven, the government had to a lot of companies during the pandemic. The government had to bail out. Question eight, oh no, I think I behind my phone. I think I left behind my phone. Question nine, you don't want to miss this amazing opportunity. Miss out on. And question 10, the phrasal verb for arrive is show up. So how did you do with that quiz? Was it easy or was it difficult? Now I'll explain every phrasal verb in detail with the definition and example sentence as well. To phase something in. When you phase something in, it means that you introduce something new, but you introduce it gradually, which means little by little. And generally what we're introducing is a new law, a new rule, a new regulation, or a new policy. So let's say that your company has a new policy and they're introducing a dress code. A dress code will tell you what you can and cannot wear to work. Now, let's say they announce the new dress code, but they say we're phasing in the new dress code over the next two months. Now, why would they want to introduce it little by little? Well, maybe it's because they want to give you time to prepare. You might have to go out and buy new clothing, for example. So you might have to save money to do that and get comfortable doing that as well. So maybe the first week they introduce the new shirts that they want you to wear. And then the next week it's the new shoes. And the following week it's the new pants. And little by little they phase in the new dress code. Number two, to block off. Now the thing about phrasal verbs is they're always used in a very specific context. So in this context of block off, we're talking specifically about time in your calendar or on your schedule. So you're blocking off time. So what does that mean? It means that you reserve that time for a specific task or activity and you reserve that time so no one else can schedule a meeting with you or no one else can assign you a task during those specific blocks of time because you block them off. So let's say you're preparing for the IELTS and you might block off Monday, Wednesday, Friday from seven to nine in your calendar and that is the time you're going to spend studying for IELTS. Or if you have an important deadline at work, you might block off the entire day. 
So you might block off Monday and just focus on that task so you can meet the deadline. So this is probably something you do every single day anyway for time management purposes. And now you know how to explain that naturally in English. Number three, to clear out. And again, remember, phrasal verbs are used in a very specific context. And in this context, we're talking about clearing out of a location, like a restaurant or even a conference, an office, a mall, any location that has a lot of people in it generally. And when people clear out of a location, it means they simply leave the location, but that location then becomes empty. So the majority or all of the people leave a location. That's when you clear out of a location. So let's say you go to lunch at a restaurant around 1.30 and it's really busy. You get the last available table and you're eating your lunch, you're talking to your coworker, and then around 2.30, you look around and you notice that you're the only table left in the restaurant. And remember, the restaurant was full when you got there. So you could turn to your coworker and say, wow, it really cleared out, which means everybody left the restaurant. Number four, to do without something. This is a really useful one because it's a fact of life. You're going to have to do without certain things at certain times in your life. So when you do without something, it means you manage despite the lack of, and it's the lack of the something that you do without. So let me give you an example. Maybe finances are a little tight. You didn't get that bonus you were hoping for. So you might say, we'll have to do without a cleaner for the next few months. Do without a cleaner. So a cleaner is someone who cleans your house, a house cleaner. Now, previously, a lot of people called this a maid. I know many people in certain countries still call it a maid. In North America, it's considered outdated and even a little politically incorrect to call someone a maid. We now call them house cleaners. So just so you know, it's more politically correct to use house cleaner. So you have to manage, manage your day to day, manage your house despite the lack of a house cleaner. We have to do without a house cleaner because I didn't get the bonus. So you can use this in a personal context like I just gave you, or you can use this in a work context as well. Maybe your assistant quit and you're having trouble finding a new assistant. So you might say, well, I guess I'll have to do without an assistant for the next month, which means you have to manage all your work without an assistant do without something. It's a very useful phrasal verb because we all have to do without certain things at certain points in our life. Our next phrasal verb, to force out. This is a very useful business phrasal verb. You're going to hear it in the media, newspapers, all the time. When someone is forced out, it means that they are asked to leave their position but it wasn't their decision to do so. Notice the sentence structure I used. I put this in the passive, to be forced out. For example, the CEO was forced out after the scandal. So there's a scandal, obviously it didn't look good for the CEO, so the company wanted him to leave. The CEO himself did not want to leave, but the company wanted him to leave. So the CEO was forced out. Now, if you use it in the active sentence, you'd be talking about who forced out the CEO. So you might say the board of directors forced the CEO out after the scandal. So you can absolutely use this in the active, but it's very commonly used in the passive. Our next phrasal verb, number six, to sink in. When something sinks in, it becomes clear in your mind. And the something that's sinking in is information, news, an event. For example, 
It took him a while before his mother's death sunk in. So his mother died, but that fact, that event didn't sink in for some time. It didn't become clear. So he didn't process it. He didn't fully understand it. He didn't fully accept it as a fact, as a reality for some time. So the event, his mother's death, didn't sink in. So we do use this a lot for tragic events, but we can also use this with difficult or complicated information. For example, let's say your coworker is explaining a new accounting software and it's pretty technical. So your coworker is explaining it, explaining it, explaining it quite quickly. And you might say, give me a minute to let that sink in. So that is the information, the information your coworker was just explaining. And for that, the information to sink in, it means for you to fully understand it, to fully process it. So we can use it for tragic events, but we can also use this for complicated information. Number seven, to bail out. This is another must know business phrasal verb, but you can also use it in your personal life as well. When you bail someone out, it means that you rescue them and you rescue them from a financially difficult situation. So remember that CEO that was forced out in our previous example? Well, maybe he had a sister that bailed him out. His sister bailed him out, which means his sister helped him financially. So maybe she gave him a place to stay because he couldn't afford his rent. She gave him food because he couldn't afford groceries and she gave him money because he didn't have any. His sister bailed him out. So we can use it in a personal context, but this is commonly used in a business context in the sense of the government bailing out companies because they're about to go bankrupt. And why would the government do that? Well, because that company is important for the economy. For example, in the US, the company Chrysler, which is an automobile company, they've been bailed out by the government multiple times. Chrysler as a company has almost gone bankrupt multiple times and the government has come in and bailed the company out. They bailed Chrysler out. Number eight, to leave something behind. This is a very useful one in your everyday vocabulary. When you leave something behind, it simply means that you forget something at a specific location. So we do this all the time, right? We go to a restaurant, a cafe, we put our phone on the counter, we get our coffee and we go. And oh no, I left my phone behind. I think I left my phone behind at the cafe. So it's just the same as saying, I think I forgot my phone at the cafe. You can use this with any object. You can leave behind your keys, your sweater, your jacket, your computer, whatever you want. So this is a very useful one. So what about you? Have you ever left something important behind? Maybe you left your cell phone behind or your laptop behind or important family photos behind. Have you ever left something behind? Let us know in the comments. Number nine, to miss out on something. To miss out on something. And this is when you miss an important opportunity or an experience that shouldn't have been missed. So let's say that you work for Tesla and Elon Musk was making an appearance at your office that day and you were going to get to meet Elon Musk, but your bus was late and you didn't get to work on time and you didn't get to meet Elon Musk. You, my friend, just missed out on an opportunity of a lifetime. You missed out on meeting Elon Musk. So you could say, I can't believe I missed out. You can just end it there. I can't believe I missed out. If you want to continue, you can say, I can't believe I missed out on meeting Elon Musk. And finally, number 10, to show up. 
To show up has a very simple definition. It means to appear or arrive. Native speakers don't really use appear or arrive. We use show up. For example, what time did you show up to the party? I would never say what time did you arrive to the party. I wouldn't say that. That sounds unnatural, outdated, too formal. I would say what time did you show up? What time did you show up to the party? What time did you show up last night? Now, let's say you got to work late one day and your boss is standing at your desk as you're walking to your desk and you're 45 minutes late and your boss might look at you and say, oh, how nice of you to finally show up. That's obviously sarcastic, <laughs> but this happens a lot if you get to a party really late or even if you're just having dinner at home with your your husband or your wife, but dinner is normally at seven and you don't get home till 7.30 and your husband or your wife has been waiting and waiting and waiting. When you get home, they might say, oh, how nice of you to finally show up. So we use this a lot in a sarcastic way when someone is late, but we also use it just to talk about getting somewhere. Oh, I showed up at, and then you say the time. So now that you feel more comfortable with these phrasal verbs, how about we do the exact same quiz again and you can compare your score from the first time to the second time. So let's do that quiz again now. Question one, the phrasal verb used when you gradually introduce a new rule, policy, or law is? The phrasal verb is? to phase in. Question two, if you want to reserve a specific time in your calendar, you can block it. You can block it off. Question three, when the fire alarm went off, everyone of the building, everyone cleared out of the building. Question four, we'll have to air conditioning this summer. We'll have to do without. Question five, if someone is removed from a position against their will, they are, they are forced out of that position. Number six, the phrasal verb used when information becomes clear in one's mind is to sink in. Question seven, the government had to a lot of companies during the pandemic. The government had to bail out. Question eight, Oh no, I think I behind my phone. I think I left behind my phone. Question nine, you don't want to miss this amazing opportunity. Miss out on. And question 10, the phrasal verb for arrive is show up. Question one, this new app I downloaded, so much memory. This new app I downloaded takes up. Question two, when a company expands into other locations, it, it branches out. Question three, the phrasal verb used when you write something down is jot down. Question four, can you, the performance reports next week, can you carry out? Question five, I'm having a hard time, the assignment. 
I'm having a hard time keeping up with. Question six: If you enter your information in a form, you fill in or fill out. So C. Question seven: The CEO might this week. The CEO might drop in. Question eight: If you delay an event, you you push it back. Question nine: If you cancel an event, you you call it off. And question ten: I'm not sure who's presenting. We're still the details. We're still sorting out the details. So, how did you do with that quiz? Share your score in the comments, and now I'll explain each phrasal verb in detail. One, to take up. This means to occupy or to fill. Now, we use this specifically with two different nouns. You can take up time, and you can take up space. And they're both very commonly used. For example, I could say this meeting took up my whole morning, so it occupied or filled the amount of time. Now we can also use this with space. For example, I need a new couch because my couch takes up too much space, so it occupies or fills space. So remember, you can use this with both time and space, and they're both very commonly used. Number two, to branch out. Now this means to expand, and we use this specifically in a business context. So let's say you're in a meeting and you're discussing how to increase your profits. You might suggest branching out into new markets. So if you only sell in North America, you can branch out, expand, and sell in Europe or in Asia, Africa, for example. We need to branch out into new markets. Number three, this is a fun one, to jot down. Now you would probably understand this from context. In the meeting, I jotted down a few notes. I jotted down a few notes, so it's the exact same thing as write down. I wrote down a few notes, but it's very commonly used. So someone might ask you, maybe your boss or a colleague even might say, "Hey, can you jot this down?" And then they might give you a number or a date or a location, and you write it down. Now, of course, not many people use pen and paper anymore, right? We take electronic notes. But if your colleague asks you to jot something down, you can absolutely take out your phone and make a note in your phone. Jot it down in your phone. Write it down in your phone. So this still applies, even though we don't really use pen and paper much. Number four, to carry out. This means to perform or to conduct, and we use this specifically in a business context. For example, next week we're carrying out our customer surveys, our student surveys. We're carrying out our surveys. We're conducting them. We're performing them. So I'm just going to do the survey. That's the simplest way to say it. Next week we're doing the surveys. We're carrying out the surveys. Number five. This is an important one, so make sure you jot it down. Number five: to keep up with something. This means to make sufficient progress on. Let's say that you have this many orders, and it's your job to fulfill those orders. If you fulfill this many, you've kept up with. The orders you've made sufficient progress, but if you fulfill this many, or this many, or this many, or anything less than the total number of orders, then you haven't 
kept up with the orders. You haven't made sufficient progress on. Now, of course, you can use this with many things other than orders. You can use it with your studies, your reading list, your chores, your performance reports, your filing, your scheduling. You can use it with many, many, many other tasks. Number six, to fill out or to fill in a form. Now, this is one that confuses a lot of students and they ask me, do I fill out a form? Do I fill in the form? What's the difference? The reality is there is no difference specifically when we're talking about a form. Now, when you have to fill out an application, you could also fill in an application. Fill out your passport renewal. You can fill in your passport renewal. In this specific context, there's no difference. Number seven, to drop in. This is a great phrasal verb because you can use it both in a business context or a social context. Now, to drop in simply means to visit. So, if you're talking to a friend, and you're planning to visit that friend, you can say, how about I drop in Saturday morning? How about I visit Saturday morning? Now, in a business context, you might have a client that wants to drop in, that wants to visit, or you might drop in on a client just to say hello and to keep that relationship going. So you can use this in both a social and a business context. Number eight, to push back. This means to delay or postpone in the context of a scheduled event. So a scheduled event like a meeting. Let's say the meeting was scheduled for Monday, but everyone is really busy on Monday. Well then push the meeting back until Wednesday. Postpone it until Wednesday. Now you can use this in a social context. So you might be planning your wedding anniversary and it's your 10 year wedding anniversary. And the actual date is March 30th, but everyone is busy. So you might push it back until the middle of April so more people can attend. Well, everyone's busy, so let's push back the party until next week, until two weeks from now. So you can push back a scheduled event, which means to delay or postpone. Number nine, to call off. Now, this means to cancel a scheduled event. So remember in our last one, to push back, you delay or postpone. But the other alternative is simply to cancel it. But generally, when you call something off, it's because there were some problems or issues associated with it. But the problem or issue could be a scheduling conflict and just people couldn't attend. So let's say you were planning a conference for the summer, but nobody registered because everyone's really busy in the summer. So you might discuss it with your team and say, let's call off the conference. Attendance is too low, so let's call it off. Let's cancel it. Now you can also use this in a social context. You might call off your wedding, but if you canceled your wedding, then most likely there was a problem, an issue, a big one, right? So in that context, in a social event, most people will wonder what happened. Why did they call off their wedding? Why did they call off their anniversary? They're going to assume that something is wrong. And number 10, to sort out. This means to organize or to fix if there's a problem. For example, I need to sort out my travel plans. So it could mean I just need to organize them. So I need to decide 
when I'm going to travel, what airline I'm going to use, what hotel I'm going to use. I need to sort out my travel plans. But I can also use it if there's some sort of problem and I need to fix it. For example, my flight was canceled, so I need to sort out my travel plans. I need to fix this problem with my plans. So to sort something out, you can organize it or you can fix it if there's a problem. Now that you're more comfortable with these phrasal verbs, let's do the exact same quiz from the beginning again, and you can compare your score from the first time to the second time. So let's do that same quiz now. Question one, this new app I downloaded, so much memory. This new app I downloaded takes up. Question two, when a company expands into other locations, it, it branches out. Question three, the phrasal verb used when you write something down is jot down. Question four, can you, the performance reports next week, can you carry out? Question five, I'm having a hard time, the assignment. I'm having a hard time keeping up with. Question six, if you enter your information in a form, you fill in or fill out, so C. Question seven, the CEO might this week. The CEO might drop in. Question eight, if you delay an event, you, you push it back. Question nine, if you cancel an event, you, you call it off. And question 10, I'm not sure who's presenting, we're still, the details. We're still sorting out the details. Question one, you're not going to paying $500 for that. You're not going to talk me into. Question two, Mariah, the sales proposal yesterday. Mariah drew up. Question three, good news, because everyone, we met the deadline. Because everyone stepped it up. Question four, if you keep skipping breaks, you're going to, you're going to burn out. Question five, that's a great point, you should, at the meeting. You should bring it up. Question six, who do you the most in your family? Who do you look up to? Question seven, how long do we need to at the party? How long do we need to stick around? Question eight, your tires look really you should get new ones. Your tires look really worn out. Question nine, the seller tried to, so we didn't buy it. The seller tried to rip us off. Question 10, I noticed that this report, our production costs. This report, honed in on. How did you do with the quiz? Was it easy or difficult? Share your score in the comments and don't worry if it was hard because now I'll explain every phrasal verb in detail. Number one, to rip off. 
We use this when someone is selling something or buying something and the buyer feels that the price is too high compared to the value of whatever they're buying. For example, I can't believe I paid $200 for that. She ripped me off. Now notice the sentence structure. You rip someone off. She ripped me off. Another example, she told everyone that I ripped her off, but it was a fair price. So just because someone claims you ripped them off, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Number two, to wear out. We use this when something is damaged or weakened because of age, it's old, or because of use, you've used it a lot. For example, I wore out my tennis shoes last summer. If someone said that to me, I would assume they played a lot of tennis last summer. They played so much tennis that they wore out their shoes. They became damaged from use, from continually playing tennis. We also use this in an adjective form to be worn out. So it would be very common to say, I need to buy new tennis shoes because mine are worn out. So of course are because shoes is plural and we need the plural form of the verb to be. Mine, my tennis shoes are worn out. So both forms are very common. Number three, to draw up. We use this when you need to prepare paperwork. And generally that paperwork is for a contract, an agreement, a proposal, generally something that two people need to sign or agree on to make it official. For example, I asked my lawyer to draw up the papers. Whenever you're dealing with a lawyer, the papers are going to be official. So this is a perfect time to use to draw up. Or you could say, we're waiting for our bank to draw up the mortgage agreement. So that's another very official document that you need to sign and you can use the phrasal verb to draw up. Number four, to burn out. This is a phrasal verb that has gotten a lot of attention recently, especially with the pandemic. Because to burn out, this is when you feel exhausted mentally or physically from prolonged stress. Stress of work, stress of a situation like a pandemic, stress of a family situation like a divorce or an illness, something like that, but a prolonged period. You can be stressed out for a day, but when you burn out, it means you've had that stress for a long period of time, several weeks, several months, or even several years. For example, I burned out at my last job. So perhaps I was working so much that I went through this period of prolonged stress. I burned out. Another example, I burned out after caring for my aging parents. So caregivers often experience burnout. So you can use this in a work situation or you can use it in a personal situation as well. Number five, to look up to someone. So notice we have two prepositions, look up to and then someone. We use this when you admire someone or you respect someone. So I could say, I looked up to him like a father. So of course I admire and respect my father and I'm comparing the situation to someone else. I looked up to him, I admired him like a father. Another example, I really look up to my boss. So you admire your boss, or you respect your boss, you hold your boss in high regard. So you can use this in a work situation, you can look up to people, and you can use this in a social situation, a family situation. You can have many different people in your life that you look up to for different reasons. Number six, to step up. Now that's the phrasal verb, but we most commonly use it in the expression to step it up. 
Notice that it, it's very important to step it up, to step it up. This simply means to work harder or to try harder. Now, you can say, we need to step it up if we're going to meet the deadline. So you have this deadline, you need to work harder. So it's the same as saying, we need to work harder if we're going to meet the deadline. Step it up. Now, what is this it in the expression? Well, the it would represent work or effort. We need to step up our work. We need to step up our effort. Step it up. I encourage you to use it that way. Step it up because you'll sound like a native speaker. We have a really common expression with this, step it up, and then you add the two words, a notch. Step it up a notch. If you look at a dial, a notch is one move on the dial. So it represents a little bit, a small amount. Step it up a notch. It's just like saying step it up a little bit. So that's just a common expression. You need to step it up a notch if you want to meet the deadline. So you can use it with a notch, it's very common, or you can use it without. Number seven, to hone in on. This is another two preposition phrasal verb. We have hone in on, hone in on something. And this means to really focus on something, to put all your attention on something specific. For example, if we want to get more customers, we should really hone in on small business owners. So maybe right now you're not being very specific and you're looking at all customers, but you want to hone in on one specific segment of the population, small business owners. So you're going to focus on them. You're going to hone in on them. Another example for the presentation, we should really hone in on South America. So maybe you're a global company and you have branches all over the world, but for this specific presentation, you're going to hone in on one specific part of the world, South America. Now many native speakers, native speakers, not students, many native speakers mistakenly say home in on. We need to home in on. And that's because in pronunciation they're very similar. Hone in, home in. And hone, what's that? It's not really used very much, but everybody knows the word home. But this isn't correct. The expression is not home in on. The expression is hone in on. So make sure you get that both in pronunciation, hone, and in spelling as well. And if you hear a native speaker say home in on, they're incorrect. Number eight, this is a must know phrasal verb to bring up. And this is when you begin a discussion on a specific topic. For example, if you're in a staff meeting, it would be very common for the boss or whoever's leading the meeting to say, before we end the meeting, does anyone have anything to bring up? Does anyone have a specific topic they want to discuss? Does anyone have anything to bring up? Or after the meeting, you might tell another colleague, I didn't have a chance to bring up the marketing proposal. So you didn't have a chance to discuss this specific topic, the marketing proposal. Maybe you ran out of time. Number nine, to talk into. And the sentence structure is to talk someone into something. And this means to convince someone to do something. For example, she talked me into helping her move. She convinced me to help her move. So when someone uses this, oh, she talked me into helping her move, it gives you the impression that the person didn't really want to do the activity, but somebody convinced them. But please, I really need your help, I'll buy pizza. Or maybe you could say, my team talked me into bringing up the bonus at the staff meeting. So notice I use bring up, discuss a specific topic, the bonus. 
my team talked me into bringing up the bonus. Now, because maybe discussing the bonus is a little bit of a sensitive issue and nobody wants to do it, but your team convinced you, lucky you, <laughs> so they talked you into it. And number 10, to stick around. This is a must use phrasal verb. You can use it in a social setting or a professional setting. To stick around means to stay in a location for a period of time. So let's say you're at this beautiful park with a friend and after an hour or so, your friend has to leave and they say, do you wanna share an Uber? And you say, no, I'm gonna stick around a little bit longer. So you're going to stay in a specific location, the park, for a period of time. It's unknown how long you'll stay. That doesn't really matter. It's just the fact you're going to stay. I'm going to stick around a little bit longer. It's such a beautiful day. I'm going to stick around. Now you can also use this in the negative. I can't stick around very long because I have a meeting. Although it's a beautiful day, I can't stick around very long. I have a meeting to get back to. Now that you're more comfortable with these phrasal verbs, let's do that same quiz again. So here are the questions. You need to choose which phrasal verb best completes the sentence. Here are the questions. Hit pause now, complete the quiz, and whenever you're ready, hit play, and I'll share the answers. So go ahead and hit pause now. Welcome back. So how did you do on this quiz? Let's find out. Here are the answers. So hit pause, review the answers, and whenever you're ready, hit play and come back to the video. Question one, I really, because my new kitten is so cuddly. Now I'll only give you three seconds to answer the question. So if you need more time, hit pause, take as much time as you need. I really lucked out. Question two, if we, the deal now, we'll lose our deposit. If we back out of. Question three, your presentation is only 10 minutes, so make sure you don't, you don't ramble on. Question four, we only have two days to fix all these errors. I don't know how we'll, how we'll pull it off. Question five, all travelers have to, the COVID rules and regulations, have to abide by. Question six, I once saw Brad Pitt in a restaurant, but I, and couldn't even say hello. But I clammed up. Question seven, if everything will finish the project tomorrow. If everything pans out. Question eight. The meeting was so long and boring. I'm surprised I didn't. I didn't nod off. Question nine. It just that tomorrow's our anniversary. It just dawned on me. And question 10. The proposal looks good, but let's take the afternoon to before we decide. To mull it over. So how did you do with that quiz? Was it easy, difficult? Share your score in the comments below and now I'll explain every phrasal verb in detail. Number one, to abide by. This is more of a formal phrasal verb because it's used when you accept or follow a rule or regulation. So we use it mainly with government rules, court rules, even business rules as well. 
For example, as a tourist, you have to abide by the rules of the country you're visiting. So if you see a sign that says no parking, you have to abide by that rule. You have to follow that rule. Now, remember, we also use this to say you simply accept. You accept, but then you follow it. For example, let's say you go to court because of a dispute and the court doesn't rule in your favor. You still have to abide by that decision. You have to accept it and then follow it. So this is a more formal phrasal verb, but it's very useful because we all have to abide by many different rules, regulations, and policies. Number two, to dawn on. This is an excellent phrasal verb to add to your daily vocabulary. To dawn on is when you finally realize or understand something. For example, one day it just dawned on me that I need to change careers. So one day I just realized I need to change career. So you can absolutely say realize, we're just using the phrasal verb dawn on and it's extremely common. Now, notice the sentence structure here. It dawned on me. Something dawns on someone. So the it is the realization. It dawned on me that I need to change careers. So just keep that in mind because the sentence structure is commonly used with it, dawns on, and then someone. Number three, to pull off. This is also a must know phrasal verb. When you pull something off, you're able to do something that is difficult or unlikely to do. For example, let's say you're a wedding planner and a couple comes to you and tells you they want to have this huge 300 person wedding in three weeks and they want you to plan everything. That's really difficult and it might even be unlikely that you're able to plan a 300 person wedding in three weeks. So you could say, I don't know if I can pull that off. I don't know if I can do that because it's very difficult. I don't know if I can pull that off. The that being planning the 300 person wedding. Now let's say you do successfully plan the wedding. After you could say, I can't believe I pulled that off. I can't believe I pulled off planning a 300 person wedding in only three weeks. Number four, to back out of. This is an excellent business phrasal verb. It's used when you fail to keep a commitment or a promise. Now, in a business context, a commitment could be something you agree to or arrange to. It can be formal and you have a contract in place, or it could be more informal and you just agree to it verbally. So if you don't keep that commitment, then you back out of it. For example, I can't believe the client backed out at the last minute. Now notice here, I just said backed out. I didn't use the of. We only use the of when you specify the noun, the something. I can't believe the client backed out of the agreement, the project, the plan, the proposal at the last minute. Number five, to clam up. This is an excellent phrasal verb for all of you or anyone that does public speaking because when you clam up, you're unable to speak, usually because of fear or nervousness. But this can also be used if you simply refuse to speak for whatever reason. For example, I always clam up when I'm public speaking. When I'm public speaking, I become unable to get the words out. You clam up. Now my advice to you is if you feel like you're going to clam up, just take a deep breath. Number six, to mull over. When you mull something over, you think about it or you consider it. 
And the something you're mulling over is simply an idea, an idea, a proposal, a suggestion, and you mull it over, you think about it, you consider it. So let's say you're in a meeting and a client or colleague suggests a new tool to use and you need to think about it. So you could say, give me a few days to mull it over and I'll get back to you. To mull it over, the it being using the tool, purchasing the tool, whatever you're going to do. Give me a few days to mull it over. Now you can also specify the noun and you can say, I need to mull the deal over before I commit. Number seven, to pan out. This is an extremely common phrasal verb. To pan out simply talks about how a situation develops. For example, I'm not sure how this merger will pan out. So the situation here is the merger. And we're talking about, well, how's the merger going to go? How's it going to develop? Will it be positive? Will it be negative? Will there be challenges or difficulties, benefits? That's how the situation develops. So here I'm saying, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how the merger will pan out. Now let's say the merger has some difficulties or challenges. You could say the merger didn't pan out, didn't develop, the merger didn't pan out as we had expected. Number eight, to ramble on. This is an excellent one for all you public speakers because when you ramble on, you talk at length without getting to the point. So let's say I rambled on for five minutes trying to explain the definition of ramble on and at the end, you didn't understand it at all and you're confused, you're a little annoyed because I wasted your time, I rambled on. So this is used as a negative and it's used when you're communicating an idea. So we generally use this as a complaint. The speaker rambled on for 20 minutes. Number nine, to nod off. This is when you fall asleep, but is when you fall asleep usually for a very short period of time and usually when you're not supposed to. So this isn't when you go to bed at the end of the night, okay? So let's say you're in a meeting at work and your colleague is rambling on and the topic is very boring and you start doing this. That is nodding off. And this motion of your head, what I'm doing, this is the verb to nod, nod your head. So when you fall asleep, what do you do? You nod your head. So that's where this phrasal verb to nod off comes from. And remember, we use this for short periods of time, usually when you're not supposed to fall asleep. For example, when you're driving. So I might say, I always listen to loud music when I'm driving at night, so I don't nod off. And number 10, I love this phrasal verb, to luck out. When you luck out, you're very lucky in a specific situation. So let's say there's this major sale on the new iPhone model and they're selling for 50% off and you go to the store and you get the very last one. You could say, I can't believe I lucked out and got the new iPhone for 50% off. You lucked out, you were very lucky in this specific situation. Or let's say you're driving during rush hour and you're going to an appointment and you get a parking spot right in front of the office. In rush hour, downtown, you can say, I can't believe I lucked out and got such an amazing parking spot. 
Or if you're telling that story to a friend, I got this parking spot right in front of the building downtown during rush hour. They could say, wow, you really lucked out. You really lucked out by getting that parking spot. Now that you feel more comfortable with the phrasal verbs, let's do that exact same quiz again so you can see how much progress you made. So here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play to see the answers. Here are the answers. Hit pause and compare your answers to the correct answers. Question one, she's not, she's just really good at basketball. She's not showing off. Question two, it's hard to meditate when my kids keep when my kids keep barging in. Question three, we've been friends for 20 years. I'm not going to let this, I'm not going to let this come between us. Question four, it's amazing how fast the company after the pandemic, the company bounced back. Question five, I need to call the garage. My car has been all week. My car has been acting up. Question six, his speech didn't. The urgency of the situation. His speech didn't get across. Question seven, just can close any deal. We can, we can count on her. Question eight, I can't give you the day off tomorrow, but I can by letting you leave early. I can make it up to you. Question nine, they said the price is too high, but give them a week, they'll, they'll come around. Question 10, my boss always makes me stay late. I don't know why I, I put up with it. How'd you do with the quiz? Share your score in the comments below and don't worry if it was difficult because now I'm going to explain every phrasal verb in detail. Number one, to come around to an opinion or an idea. And this means to change your opinion or to see a new point of view. Now notice the sentence structure because we have two prepositions, around, and two, and then after two, we need something. We need a noun, an opinion, or an idea. For example, I came around to the new job after I heard about the benefits package. So remember, this means you changed your opinion. So previously, you didn't want the new job, but now you've come around to it. So you've changed your opinion. Now you want the new job because you heard about the benefits package. We commonly use this without the preposition to and without specifying the something when the something has already been mentioned. For example, at first I didn't want to move to Boston, but I came around after I visited. So notice, I didn't say I came around to something because the something had already been mentioned. So I came around to the idea after I visited. Number two, to get across a point or a message. And this is when you clearly and effectively communicate a point or a message. For example, 
make sure you get across that the project is over budget. So if you're having a meeting with a client and your boss has this very particular message or idea, the project is over budget and your boss wants you to communicate that in a clear, effective way. Your boss wants to make sure you get that across. Now we also use this when you're talking, you're talking, you're talking, and the ideas aren't really coming out very well. And after a while, you stop and you say, what I'm trying to get across is, and then you state your point. What I'm trying to get across is, the project is over budget. Number three, to show off. This is when you deliberately display your skills or abilities in a way to impress other people. Now this is frequently used in the negative, don't show off, don't show off. But there's definitely a time and a place when you want to show off. For example, when you're going to a job interview, you shouldn't be modest. You should show off your skills and abilities. You should talk about all your awards, your accomplishments, your degrees, the compliments you've received. You want to show off all of your experience to the interviewer. So an interview is the perfect time to show off. Also, if you're going for your IELTS exam, you don't want to be modest with your knowledge of the English language. You want to show off your abilities by using a range of grammatical structures and a range of phrasal verbs and idioms and expressions. You want to show off to the interviewer. Number four, to count on. Now this is exactly the same as to rely on or to depend on. So you have three different phrasal verbs all with on that mean the exact same thing. And this is of course when you trust someone or something to complete a specific task or objective. For example, I can always count on Selma to stay late. So you can trust Selma to complete the specific task or objective, which is to stay late. And remember, you could replace this with rely on. I can always rely on Selma or depend on. I can always depend on Selma. Now we frequently use this in a question response. For example, can I count on you? Can I count on you to close the deal? And then you can reply back and say, absolutely, you can count on me. Number five, to come between. Now this is when something disturbs a relationship. And that relationship can be a professional relationship, a social relationship, romantic, family relationship. It can be any kind of relationship. For example, Jacob and Marcus were best friends until Sylvie came between them. So that's the image you could have. They were close, Jacob and Marcus, but then Sylvie came between them and now they're divided. Sylvie disturbed their relationship. Now it's very common for a girl or a guy to come between a relationship, but it doesn't have to be a person. It could be that Jacob and Marcus were very close, but the promotion came between them. The new job came between them. Their family came between them. Their politics came between them. Their religion came between them. It could be anything came between them. Money is a good one as well that comes between people in relationships. And remember, you can use this in any type of relationship. Number six, to put up with something or someone. And notice this is a two preposition phrasal verb, put up with, put up with. And we use this to say that you tolerate bad behavior or unwanted behavior to put up with. For example, I don't know how you put up with your boss. 
I don't know how you tolerate your boss. Now, of course, we can be more specific and specify the action that the boss does. I don't know how you put up with your boss's constant criticism, for example, or your boss's distasteful jokes, for example. I don't know how you tolerate it. Now, we commonly use this to say, I'm not going to put up with and then the behavior. I'm not going to put up with your constant criticism any longer. Number seven, to bounce back. Now, to bounce back, this is when you recover or recuperate. Now, you can use this when you recover from a negative situation in a business context, like for example, a bad sales quarter or a bad product launch, for example, but it can also be when you recover or recuperate from an illness. So you can use it in both those situations. For example, in a workplace situation, you could say, I don't know how we'll bounce back from our loss in Q2. So I don't know how we'll recover. And then you could have a discussion. How can we bounce back? Does anyone have any ideas on how we can bounce back? Now, in terms of recovering or recuperating from an illness, you could say, it took me a while to bounce back after my surgery. So it took me a while to recover, recuperate. Number eight, to act up. This means to behave badly or strangely. This is very commonly used with parents describing the actions of their young children or even their older children. My son keeps acting up, behaving badly. But we can also use this with devices and objects. For example, my computer keeps acting up, behaving strangely. My computer keeps acting up. I hope it doesn't break. Number nine, to make it up to someone. This is quite a long one, so pay attention to this sentence structure. To make it up to someone. Now, we use this when you try to compensate for a wrongdoing. For example, let's say it's your best friend's birthday and you can't go for whatever reason. So this is the wrongdoing, not going to your best friend's birthday party. Now, if you want to compensate for that wrongdoing, you could say, I'm so sorry, I can't make your birthday party. I promise I'll make it up to you. I'll make it up to you by taking you out for a nice dinner. I'll make it up to you by going to the movies with you. I'll make it up to you by buying you a really nice present. So those are the ways you're going to compensate. Now you might be wondering, what is this it? The make it up to someone? We use it with it because what you're trying to compensate for has already been explained, so you don't have to say it again. Now, you can use this in a business context. Let's say you went over budget on a client's project and you might say to your team, how are we going to make it up to the client? How are we going to compensate for our wrongdoing? The wrongdoing is you went over budget. And then maybe someone would suggest we can make it up to them by offering a discount or offering a free product, offering an extra service. So those are how you're going to compensate for the wrongdoing, to make it up to someone. Number 10, to barge in. When you barge in, you enter a place, a location unexpectedly, and you interrupt whatever's taking place. For example, I was in my office working and this kid just barged in and handed me his CV, but later I hired him. 
So by saying the kid barged in, it implies that he didn't have an appointment, he wasn't expected, he just barged in unexpectedly and he interrupted whatever I was working on. But in this case, it was successful because he got the job. Now that you understand these phrasal verbs a lot better, let's do that exact same quiz from the very beginning again. Here are the questions for the quiz. You need to complete each sentence using the correct phrasal verb. So go ahead and hit pause now and complete the quiz. Here are the correct answers. Go ahead and hit pause and see how well you did. Question one, you've been arguing for months. You need to, you need to make up. Question two, I said we need to diversify our product line and I, and I stand by that. Question three, I always have a cup of tea at night to help me after a busy day. To help me wind down. Question four. My girlfriend is studying abroad and I'm really, and I'm really aching for her. Question five. Your suit doesn't look comfortable. Why don't you? something more comfortable. Why don't you slip into? Question six, it's getting late, so I'm going to, I'm going to turn in. Question seven, Salma took this job to her accounting experience. To beef up. Question eight, have you, who's going to give the presentation? Have you nailed down? Question nine, sometimes it's easier to a trained professional to open up to. Question 10, the party was fun, but I, when they started talking about politics. But I zoned out. So how did you find that quiz? Was it easy? Was it difficult? Don't worry because I'm going to explain every phrasal verb in detail and it will definitely be easy by the end of the lesson. So let's do that now. One to ache for, to ache for. This is a very nice romantic phrasal verb. Now we really use this in the context of a romantic relationship. So make sure you use that appropriately. And to ache for something or someone is when you really, really want that something or someone. For example, he was lonely and aching for love. So this is perhaps a little more of a poetic phrasal verb. You will probably hear it in novels, stories, movies, TV. He was aching for love. So maybe you won't use that in your vocabulary, but you'll likely hear it in romance movies or romance novels. Now you may be more likely to use ache for someone. Let's say your husband is overseas on a business trip and he'll be gone for two or three weeks. You might say, I'm aching for my husband. So if you're talking to your friends or family, even your colleagues, you could say, oh, I'm really aching for my husband. He's been gone for two weeks already. Number two, to beef up. This is a fun one. When you beef something up, you make it stronger or more important. Now we do use this in the context of bodybuilders and they can beef themselves up, become 
more muscular. So you can use that in a fitness context, but we also use this in more of a business context, perhaps surprisingly, because you might say, I need to beef up my resume. I need to make my resume stronger or more important. I need to beef up my communication skills, for example. Number three, to make up. And in this context, we're talking about to make up with someone, with someone. To make up with someone is when you forgive someone after an argument or a dispute. In a family context, young kids argue a lot, right? And older kids too. But you might say to your son, your daughter, you need to make up with your sister. You need to make up with your brother. You need to make up with your cousin or a friend. And you list a specific person, which means you need to forgive that person. Stop being angry at that person. Stop fighting with that person. So we definitely use this in a social context, a family context, but you can absolutely use this in a professional context. Coworkers fight as well. There are disagreements in companies. So you might say to one coworker, Sally, you need to make up with Mark. You work on the same team. You have to get along. You need to make up with each other. Number four, to nail down. This is when you understand the exact details of something or you get a firm decision on something. So let's say you're planning a conference and you have a general idea of the conference. It will take place in summer. It will be on this general topic or theme. But when are the exact dates? What specific topics? Who specifically will be the keynote speaker? Who specifically will be presenting? Who will you hire to cater the conference? You need to nail down those details. So you need to either understand the exact details or you need to make a firm decision on who's going to cater when the conference will exactly take place. So that's a very useful phrasal verb and you can use it in a business context or a social context. Number five, to open up. When you open up to someone, you talk very freely about your feelings or your emotions, things that make you quite vulnerable, things you probably don't share with everybody. For example, after years, she finally opened up about his death. So for many years, there was this tragic death perhaps, and she didn't really talk about it. She didn't talk about her feelings about the death, but then after years, she opened up. She started talking freely about how she felt, the circumstances, how she's dealing with it, those types of things, her inner feelings and emotions. Now notice I didn't use to someone. I could say she opened up to her family about his death. So you have about and then the specific topic and to and the specific people. You'll commonly hear people say, I've never opened up to anybody like this before. If someone says that to you, they're basically saying they feel very comfortable around you. They feel like they can share their inner thoughts, feelings, emotions. And that's a very positive thing. It shows you have a very close relationship. Number six, to slip into something. Now this is when you quickly put on a piece of clothing. So this is a very specific phrasal verb. It's only used with clothing. Now, for example, this shirt is quite pretty, isn't it? But let's be honest, it's not the most comfortable shirt. So after I'm done recording this video, I'm going to slip into a t-shirt. I'm going to put on a t-shirt. Or if it's first thing in the morning and you're in your house coat, but then you hear your doorbell, you might quickly slip into some sweatpants and answer the door. So it's simply another way to say put on. 
Number seven, to stand by something. When you stand by something, it's used to show that you still support or believe something. So I might say we stand by our opinion that interest rates need to increase. So that's my opinion, that's my belief. Interest rates need to increase. I stand by that. I still support that, I still believe that. So you'll hear this a lot from people in power, politicians, executives in business. They'll have an opinion, have a belief, and then they'll state, I stand by that. To let you know they still believe that specific opinion. Do you stand by that and if so, why? Uh, I stand by that. Uh, yes, I stand by that. And the reason simply is... Now we also use this with stand by someone. When you stand by someone, it means that you support someone, usually when something negative has happened. So let's say that your coworker was accused of stealing from the company, but you know your coworker didn't do it. You might say, I stand by her, I stand by her, which means you're going to support her in this difficult time. Number eight, to wind down, to wind down. This is an excellent phrasal verb because it means to relax after a busy or stressful day. So you might say, I always read at the end of the day to wind down. To help me wind down, I always read at the end of the day, or I go for a walk after work to wind down. So it just means to relax, but it's another way of saying it, and it implies that you were very busy or stressed out, to wind down. Number nine, to zone out. This is when you stop paying attention for a short period of time. Now we've all done this, especially when we were kids in school and your teacher's talking and you just zone out. Now generally people zone out because they don't have interest in a particular topic. For example, whenever people talk about sports, I zone out. I just stop listening and I start thinking about something else in my own head and I'm not listening to the conversation about sports. I zone out, I stop paying attention. But then when the conversation changes, I'll pay attention again. So it's always for that short period of time. Number 10, to turn in. This is a very useful phrasal verb because it simply means to go to bed. It's another way of saying to go to bed and it's very common. So of course you can say, I'm tired, I'm going to bed. But you can also say, I'm tired, I'm going to turn in. I'm going to turn in. And it's extremely commonly used, so I suggest you use it. You can use it as a suggestion, hey, it's getting late and you have that job interview tomorrow. You should turn in, you should go to bed. Or you can use it in question form as well. What time did you turn in? What time did you go to bed? Now that you're more comfortable with these phrasal verbs, how about we do that exact same quiz again and you can see how much you've improved. So here are the questions. Of course, hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play and I'll share the answers. So you can go ahead and hit pause now. How'd you do on that quiz? Well, let's find out. Here are the answers. Go ahead and hit pause and figure out how you did. Question one, I used to play video games every day, but eventually I grew out of it. Question two, do you know why Sarah of the meeting earlier today? walked out of the meeting. Question three, can you add mustard to the shopping list? I just, I just used it up. Question four, you should your old books to your community store. You should give away. Question five, the bridge is 
because there was an accident. The bridge is blocked off. Question six. My boss said we can with canceling the contract. We can go ahead. Question seven. My company using cell phones during work hours. My company frowns on. Question eight. I'm sorry I at you during the meeting. I overreacted. Last out. Question nine. Can you help me this error? Sort out. Question 10. The presentation was really long, so I for a bit. So I wandered off. So how did you do with that quiz? Was it easy or was it difficult? Well, now I'm going to explain every phrasal verb in detail. Number one, to block off. This is when you obstruct an exit to prevent people from leaving. This is a very common phrasal verb because on your daily commute to work, you may have to take a detour, which means take an alternative route because your regular exit is blocked off. So let's say you get to work 15 minutes late. You can say, sorry I'm late, Main Street was blocked off. And most likely that street or exit is blocked off because of construction. It's also possible that there was an accident or perhaps there's something like a parade or a protest that's preventing people from using that exit. Number two, to lash out. When you lash out, it means you react angrily. You react with very strong negative emotion. So this phrasal verb is negative and it's used in a negative way. So you might say, she lashed out when I suggested a different approach. So you shared an opinion and the person reacted very negatively, very angrily. They lashed out. Now for this phrasal verb, it's very common to say at someone. She lashed out at me when I suggested a different approach. The at someone is optional. You don't need to do it, but it can be very useful to specify who. So if you want to specify the person, then we use at someone. She lashed out at Jim. She lashed out at us. It could be the entire group. She lashed out at the client. And then you can explain the reason why. She lashed out at the client because the payment was late. Number three, to walk out. When you walk out, it means you leave a place angrily. So we have another phrasal verb with angrily. You leave a place angrily. So let's say you're meeting with your boss to discuss your performance. Now maybe you were expecting a 20% raise. A raise is a pay increase, a 20% pay increase, but your boss only offered you 2%. You might say, after my boss offered me 2%, I walked out. So you left the room, you left the office, the meeting, but you didn't just leave, you left angrily, angrily. That's the key here. So combining our last phrasal verb to lash out, to react angrily, we can say, after she lashed out at me, I walked out. Number four, to sort out. This means to resolve a problem. Now we can use this with a business professional problem. For example, let's say your payment processor isn't working and you can't accept 
payments. You might say, we need to sort this out ASAP. We need to resolve this problem ASAP. Or who can we call to sort this out? So you can absolutely use this in a professional business context when there's a problem. We commonly use this with personal issues, with relationship issues, when you have a problem with another person. So let's say you and your sister haven't spoken in months because of a disagreement. Maybe your sister lashed out at you and then you walked out of her birthday party and you haven't spoken since. Well, someone might suggest some ways you can sort it out. You need to sort it out with your sister. You need to resolve the problem. And in this case, the problem is a personal problem. So this is a great phrasal verb to use for a business context and a personal context. Number five, to use up. This is when you finish or consume 100% of something. So all of something. And that's very important because I could say, I used the olive oil. So I consumed the olive oil. But when I just say use, it doesn't tell you how much. How much olive oil did I use? I used the olive oil. But if I say, I used up the olive oil, then you know I used 100% of the olive oil, so there is none left for you or for someone else, and you have to get more. So I could say I used all the olive oil. When I say all the olive oil, all means 100%, so that is exactly the same as I used up the olive oil. Number six, to wander off. This is when you leave a place when you're not supposed to, or you leave a place without telling other people. Now, this is commonly used with children. So a mother might say, I have to watch my daughter like a hawk or she'll wander off. So little kids, they might not stay in a room. They might wander off and go into another room. But of course, that can be dangerous if nobody is watching that child. So this is commonly used with young children, but we can also use it with adults. So let's say you're on a museum tour and you're in a foreign country on a museum tour. Now, you're supposed to stay with the museum tour. You're not supposed to wander off and just go look at other areas of the museum. But you might say, uh, the tour was boring, so I wandered off. Number seven, to grow out of. This is when you lose interest in something. So to lose interest, you're no longer interested in something because you're older or more mature. For example, a lot of young kids play video games for hours and hours and hours. But as an adult, you might grow out of it. So you no longer do that. You no longer play video games for hours and hours and hours because you're older, you're more mature. Number eight, to go ahead. This means to proceed. This is a very useful phrasal verb. We use it commonly to give someone permission to do something. So your coworker might ask you, is it okay if I send the email to the client? And you can say, sure, go ahead, go ahead, which means proceed, proceed with sending the email, go ahead. Now you can just say, go ahead, period, or you can specify what the action is. You can say, go ahead and send the email, or go ahead with and we need a gerund. Go ahead with sending the email. 
and send the email with sending the email. So pay attention to that sentence structure. Number nine, to give away. This means to provide for free. So this is a great phrasal verb. For me, I could say, I give away my best tips and advice on how to become fluent right here on this YouTube channel. Now, let's say you have a lot of items from your kids, but your kids are grown up now, but you have a lot of their clothes, their toys, even furniture for your kids. You might want to give that away. So you can provide it to another parent or someone else for free. We gave away all our kids' clothes when they moved out. So when you want to get rid of something in your house, you can sell it or you can give it away, provide it for free. And finally, number 10, to frown on. This means to disapprove of something. So you might say, my boss disapproves of casual clothes. So you can say, my boss frowns on wearing casual clothes. Notice our sentence structure, frowns on wearing. We need our gerund verb. Now that you feel more comfortable with these phrasal verbs, how about we do the exact same quiz again so you can see how much you've improved. Here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play to see the answers. Here are the answers. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, compare your answers, and when you're ready, hit play. Question one, we should the party with some karaoke. We should kick off. Question two, you don't need to, your team, I've heard great things about them. Talk up. Question three, make sure your team doesn't while the CEO is here. Horse around. Question four, it really, when Jeremy took credit for my work. Ticked me off. Question five, he's been since he lost the contract. Moping around. Question six, we're on a tight budget, but we have enough to to get by. Question seven, the expense reports have been since Sarah left. Piling up. Question eight, I've learned to my mother when she gives me relationship advice. Tune out. Question nine, she used to be very serious, but she's a bit. Loosened up. Question 10. My boss is going to when she learns we lost the account. Flip out. So how did you do with that quiz? Don't worry if it was difficult because now I'm going to explain every phrasal verb in detail. Let's get started. Number one, to tune out. This is a very useful phrasal verb because it's used to say you stop listening to someone, you stop paying attention to them because you don't like what they're saying basically. So you tune someone out. This is something that kids do all the time with their parents, right? If your parent is giving you advice and you don't wanna hear it, you just tune them out. So your parent is talking, but you're just not really listening. So you might say, I always tune out my mom when she gives me relationship advice. Now this can also happen a lot in a workplace situation. Let's say 
The coworker that sits beside you is just a very negative person and complains a lot. You might just simply tune them out. So you stop listening to them because you don't want to hear all that negativity and complaining. So you just tune them out. They're talking, but you're not listening. Number two, to tick off. This is a useful one because it means to annoy, to anger, or to irritate. Now we use this in two very specific sentence structures. It ticks someone off. It ticks me off when my coworker doesn't help. So it ticks someone off and then you explain the situation that causes the anger, the frustration, or the irritation. Now the other sentence structure is just to say someone or something ticks me off. John really ticks me off. He's so negative. John really irritates me, frustrates me, annoys me. John really ticks me off. He's so negative, but I just tune him out. Number three, to talk up. And you talk someone or something up. And that means you speak in a way that makes that someone or something sound really beneficial, really positive, really amazing, maybe even more so than the reality. So let's say you're in sales and you're trying to sell this piece of software to a company. Well, you're going to talk up that software. You're going to talk about that software in a way that really highlights all of its positive features. And you probably won't mention any negative features. You're going to talk it up. Or let's say that your really close friend applied for a job in your company. Well, you're probably going to talk up your friend. You're going to speak about your friend very enthusiastically, very positively, because you want your friend to get the job. You're going to talk up your friend. Number four, to pile up. This means simply to increase in amount. And we generally use this with work. So in general, you could say work is really piling up. Work is increasing in amount. You can use this with specific work. So you might say my expense reports are piling up. Or even with household chores, you might say the laundry is piling up. The dirty dishes are piling up. They're increasing in amount. Number five, to mope around. To mope around, this is when someone moves from one location to another, but they do it in a very unhappy way, a lazy way, a disappointed way. And it's generally because something is wrong, something specific is wrong. So maybe they just lost their job or they just broke up with their girlfriend, so they mope around the house all day. They go from the couch to the kitchen, back to the couch, but they look really upset and lazy and no energy. So this isn't really a positive thing. We generally say, stop moping around. You need to stop moping around and start looking for a job if that's the reason why you're moping around because you lost your job. Stop moping around and look for a job. Number six, to loosen up. This is a great one. It means to be more relaxed, more comfortable, or less serious. So you might say, she was very shy at first, but then she loosened up. So she became more relaxed, more comfortable. Now we often use this as advice to someone. If someone is just being too serious, you might say, loosen up, loosen up. It's similar to saying, relax a little, relax a little, loosen up. You need to loosen up. Oh, just loosen up. Number seven, to kick off. This is a great one because when you kick something off, it means you start. But we use this in the context of a sports event. 
a meeting, a conference, or even a party. So some sort of event with people. So in sports, it's very common to say the game, the match kicks off at, and then you say the time. The match kicks off at three. The game kicks off at seven. And that's just when the game starts. Now you could also say, let's kick off the meeting by, and then you can explain how you're going to start the meeting. Let's kick off the meeting by introducing the new CFO, or let's kick off the meeting by sharing the good news. Number eight, this is a fun one, to horse around. When you horse around, you behave in a silly or noisy way. So basically what children do all the time, they horse around. But you might say, the kids were horsing around and they broke my favorite vase. Now, although this is commonly used in children, it can of course be used for adults as well because adults act in silly and noisy ways all the time, right? Even in workplace contexts. So you might be talking about how your team is constantly horsing around. And as a bonus, you can also say goof around. It's an alternative, but they're both very commonly used. So horse around or goof around. Number nine, to get by. This is when you have just enough money to live on but not very much extra. So you can basically pay all your bills and that's about it. So you might say, since our twins were born, it's been more difficult to get by. You have two new babies in the house. Well, first, congratulations, but of course that's very expensive. So now you only have enough money to pay your bills, to buy the food, buy the diapers, buy the groceries, pay your mortgage, things like that. We're getting by, we're getting by. You're just surviving. So if someone knows you're going through a tough time financially, maybe you lost your job and they ask you, how's it going? Is everything okay? You could say, well, I'm getting by, I'm getting by, which lets them know you're surviving. You have enough to pay all your core expenses. And finally, number 10 to flip out. Now this can mean to become very excited, but it can also mean to become very angry or agitated. So it's when you have a very strong emotion, but that emotion can be positive excitement or it can be negative anger. And it will be obvious based on context. So if you just won a competition or a prize or the lottery, you might flip out and become very, very excited, right? The sports team flipped out when they won the gold medal. Or the team flipped out when they lost the game, the team became very angry. So you can use it in both situations. And for this expression, you can also say freak out. Freak out, flip out, they mean the same. And again, positive excitement or negative anger. So now that you're more comfortable with these phrasal verbs, how about we do that exact same quiz again so you can see how much you've improved. So here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play to see the answers. Here are the answers. Go ahead and hit pause and figure out how you did. Amazing job. Now you're going to add 100 adjectives to your speech. All of these adjectives are very advanced adjectives that will take your English from here to here. Let's get started. First, let's talk about sentence structure. Commonly, you can use to be plus adjective. Janice is nice. Of course, you need to conjugate your verb according to the subject. I am nice. Another common structure is to use adjective plus 
noun. I met a nice person. Notice the adjective comes directly before the noun, so it's article, adjective, noun. I met a nice person. Pay attention to this sentence structure. I'll also teach you more advanced sentence structures in the different examples. Now let's get started with our 100 advanced adjectives, starting from A all the way to Z. Adaptable, adaptable. This is when you're willing and able to change to suit different conditions. So let's say one minute you're editing a report, next you're leading a presentation, next you're analyzing financial information. So you're working and changing to do many different things. I'm very adaptable. Adept, adept. You're adept at something, notice that preposition at. When you're adept at something, it means you're skilled at something. You're very good at something. I'm very adept at using SAP. Adventurous, adventurous. This is when you're willing to try new or different things. A job posting might say, we're looking for someone who's adventurous because this position requires traveling all over the world. So if you're adventurous, you can apply. Affectionate, affectionate. This is showing feelings of liking or love. She gave me an, an affectionate farewell. So a very loving farewell. I summarized all 100 adjectives into a free lesson PDF that includes the adjective, the definition, and an example sentence. You can look in the description for the link to download the free lesson PDF. Ambitious, ambitious. This is when you have a strong desire to become successful in your career or in life. I'm attracted to ambitious men. Does that describe you? Are you ambitious? Artistic, artistic. This is when you're able to create or enjoy art. Would you describe yourself as artistic? Assertive, assertive. When you're assertive, it means you're confident saying what you mean or what you feel without fear. I need to work on being more assertive. I need to work on saying what I want, saying what I feel without being afraid of what other people might think of me. I need to work on being more assertive. Attentive, attentive. When you're attentive, it means you're very helpful and you take care of others. I try to be very attentive to my students, which means I try to be very helpful. Authentic, authentic. This means that you're real, you're true. You're not pretending to be someone that you're not, you're authentic. Sometimes being authentic around others is difficult. Sometimes being the real you is difficult because you're afraid that people might judge you. Approachable, approachable. This describes someone who is friendly and easy to talk to. My goal is for all my students to describe me as approachable. Would you describe me as approachable, friendly, and easy to talk to? If so, put that in the comments. Jennifer, you're approachable. Balanced, balanced. This is when you consider all sides or opinions equally. Even though she's a Democrat, she's very balanced. She considers other sides and opinions other than democratic opinions. Bright, bright. This is another way of saying smart or intelligent or someone who learns quickly. My students are all very bright. I know you'll learn these adjectives very quickly because you're bright. Broad-minded, broad-minded. This is someone who is willing to accept different behaviors, different opinions, different lifestyles. Being broad-minded is important when you work with people from around the world. Candid, 
candid. When someone is candid, it means that they're honest and they tell the truth about a situation. To be candid, I left my job because I didn't like my boss. Cheerful. This is someone who is happy and positive. Cheerful. I try to surround myself with cheerful people. Chill. Chill. This is an informal adjective but commonly used and it describes someone who is relaxed, who isn't worried, isn't anxious, who's very chill. As I get older, I become more and more chill, more relaxed. I don't stress as much. I'm not as anxious or worried. I'm chill. Are you chill? Put that in the comments if you are. I'm chill. Clever. Clever. This is another advanced way of saying smart or intelligent, someone who learns quickly. She's a very clever student. Communicative. Communicative. This describes someone who is willing to talk to others and who is willing to share information. Did you notice that Julie wasn't very communicative at the meeting today? Compassionate. Compassionate. This is someone who is very sympathetic to others, especially when others are in a difficult situation and they want to help that person. They're very compassionate. She's a compassionate reporter. Competitive, competitive. This describes someone who really wants to win and who enjoys competition. I am very competitive. Sometimes I'm a little too competitive because I love winning. What about you? Are you competitive? Charismatic, charismatic. This is someone who is well liked and well admired. And because of that, they're able to influence others easily. If you want to win the election, you need to be more charismatic. Consider it. Consider it. This is when you care about and respect others. It was very considerate of you to change the meeting because you knew I had an appointment. Constructive. Constructive. This is usually information or advice that's meant to help someone or help someone improve their performance. Can I give you some constructive criticism? Can I criticize you, but in a way that's meant to help you improve, help you improve your performance? Can I give you some constructive criticism? Coy, coy. When someone's coy, they intentionally don't reveal information because they want to make that information more engaging or interesting. She's being very coy about the party. So she's not sharing a lot of details about the party, but that makes you wonder about the party and want to know more. So it makes you interested in the party. She's being very coy about the party. Courageous, courageous. Someone who's courageous is able to control their fear or negative emotion in fearful or dangerous situations. It was very courageous of you to quit your job and go back to school in your 40s. Creative, creative. This is someone who produces or uses unique or original ideas. We're looking for someone who's creative. Curious, curious. This is someone who is interested in learning about the world around them. Being curious is a great quality when you're learning a language. Would you agree with that? If you agree, put I agree in the comments. Dependable, dependable. This is someone deserving of trust and confidence. My assistant is very dependable. Determined, determined. When you're determined, you want something really badly and you're not willing to let anything or anyone stop you from getting the thing that you want. If you're determined, you'll become fluent. That's my promise to you. But it takes determination. You need to be determined. Direct, direct. 
When someone's direct, it means they communicate in a way that says exactly what they mean in a very honest way without worrying about being judged or hurting someone's feelings. I like how our CEO is very direct even when delivering bad news. Dynamic, dynamic. This is someone who has a lot of different ideas and who is very energetic and forceful. Has anyone ever told you that you're very dynamic? Easy going, easy going. This describes someone who is relaxed and who doesn't easily get upset. My new manager is way more easy going than my last one. Eclectic, eclectic. When something is eclectic, it consists of many different types, methods, or styles. I work with an eclectic group of students in the Finally Fluent Academy. So I work with many different types of students in the Finally Fluent Academy. Emotional, emotional. This is when you have and express strong feelings and emotions. John became very emotional at his retirement party. Energetic, energetic. This is when you have a lot of energy. Even though she's almost 80, my grandmother is very energetic. Enthusiastic, enthusiastic. This is when you have an interest in a particular subject and you're very eager to want to be part of that subject. I love how enthusiastic you are about our new plan. Extroverted, extroverted. This describes a person who enjoys being with other people and are very energetic when they're with other people. Although I'm not very extroverted, I love working in sales. Exuberant, exuberant. This describes someone who is very energetic and simply happy to be alive. She's an exuberant speaker, fearless. Fearless. Of course, this means you're free from fear. Good negotiators need to be fearless. Flexible. Flexible. This is when you're able to change or be changed based on the situation. My schedule is very flexible next week. Forgiving. Forgiving. This describes someone who forgives easily. I'm thankful I have a forgiving boss a boss who forgives easily. Fruitful, fruitful. This is something that produces good results. He had a fruitful career as a lawyer. So it says he was very successful in his career. He produced good results. Frank, Frank. This describes someone who is honest and sincere. Thank you for being frank with me. Now remember that Frank is the name of a man, so you could possibly say Frank is very Frank. So a man whose name is Frank is very Frank, which means he's very honest and sincere. Fun loving, fun loving. This is when you enjoy having fun and not being too serious. Although I'm the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, I'm also very fun loving. Gregarious, gregarious. This is someone who likes being with other people. Being gregarious is an important quality of a nurse because if you're a nurse, you need to like being around other people and spending time with your patients. Genuine, genuine. This describes someone who is real and exactly what they appear to be. Her speech was genuine. Honorable, honorable. Notice that silent H, honorable. This is someone who's honest, silent H, honest and fair. She's an honorable boss and I respect her decision. Humble, humble. This is someone who is modest who shows a low estimate of their own worth. Although she makes $2 million a year, she's very humble. So this means she doesn't act like she makes $2 million a year. She drives a regular car, lives in a regular house, wears regular clothes. She's humble. Handy, handy. 
Someone who is handy means they're really skilled with using their hands, especially when it comes to tools and repairing, fixing, or even making things. I am not very handy, which means I'm not very good at repairing or fixing things or making things using tools with my hands. What about you? Would you describe yourself as handy? Are you handy? Imaginative. Imaginative. This is someone who can easily think of new, creative, original, innovative ideas. Kamal is an imaginative designer. Inquisitive. Inquisitive. This describes someone who wants to know about a lot of different things. Usually someone who's inquisitive asks a lot of questions. I love when my students are inquisitive about my lessons. So I love when my students ask questions. Impeccable, impeccable. This is something that is perfect, that has no mistakes, no errors, no flaws. Sylvia gave an impeccable performance. Intuitive, intuitive. When someone's intuitive, it means they can understand things, but more based on emotions and feelings rather than facts or information. I'm very intuitive when it comes to hiring, which means when I hire someone, I trust the feeling I get about that person rather than the facts on their resume. So they might have this amazing resume, but when I'm talking to them, if I don't get a good feeling about that person, I'm not going to hire them, which means I'm very intuitive. I trust my intuition. I'm very intuitive. Ingenious, ingenious. This is very intelligent or skillful. The way you handled that situation was ingenious. Inviting, inviting. Someone who's inviting makes you feel very welcome in any new environment or situation. The new HR manager is very inviting. Jubilant, jubilant. This is feeling and expressing great happiness, usually because of a success. The fans were jubilant after the game. So they were very happy, which means the team won. The fans were jubilant. Keen, keen. This describes someone who is very willing and eager and wants something. She's very keen. She's already followed up with me. So maybe we had an interview yesterday and she already sent me an email asking if I needed to know anything else about her. She's very keen. Kind-hearted, kind-hearted. This is someone who really enjoys helping other people. My doctor is very kind-hearted. Lively, lively. This is someone who's full of energy and enthusiasm. My team is so lively today. Logical, logical. This means reasonable based on good judgment. You made a logical decision. Loyal, loyal. This is someone who provides support in any situation. Kirk is our most loyal manager. He's been with the company for 20 years. Laudable, laudable. This is something that deserves praise even though there was no success or little success. Your actions are laudable. So even though you didn't succeed or get the result you wanted, you still deserve praise, most likely because you acted in a very responsible way. Mature, mature. When someone's mature, it means they act in a way that's very well developed emotionally. Although Chirac is only an intern, he's very mature. So this suggests he acts in a way that makes him seem older because he's more well-developed emotionally compared to his age. Meticulous, meticulous. This means very careful with close attention to detail. As a quality assurance professional, I need to be meticulous. Marvelous, marvelous. This is another way of saying very good, marvelous. 
they did a marvelous job for the new client. Nimble, nimble. This is someone who is quick and exact with either their movements or their thoughts. His nimble hands are perfect for repairing antiques. Antiques are very delicate, but he can move his hands in a very quick way. His hands are very nimble. Open-minded, open-minded. This describes someone who is willing to consider ideas or opinions that are different from their own. Doctors are becoming more and more open-minded. Optimistic, optimistic. This describes someone who is hopeful, who sees the good parts of a situation, or who believes that good will come from a situation. I'm optimistic that I'll pass my oral exam. I'm hopeful. Out of this world, out of this world. This is something that's extraordinary, superb. Your design skills are out of this world. Outgoing, outgoing. This is someone who is friendly and energetic and finds it easy and enjoyable being with other people. Now that I feel confident with my English, I'm more outgoing at work. This is something a lot of students want to have. So definitely improve your English so you can be more outgoing. Pensive, pensive. When someone is pensive, it means they're thinking and they're usually quite quiet. They're thinking very seriously. They're pensive. Julie was very pensive during our presentation, which means she was quite quiet during the presentation and she was just thinking. Proactive, proactive. This means that you take action to change something rather than waiting for the situation to happen and then simply reacting to the situation. One of my best qualities is that I'm proactive. Perceptive, perceptive. This means that you're very good at noticing details and information that other people may not notice. We really appreciate your perceptive comments. So you provided information that nobody else thought of, but you were very perceptive. We appreciate your perceptive comments. Persistent, persistent. This is when you continue doing something in a determined way, even when you face difficulties or challenges. When I'm solving a problem, I'm very persistent. Punctual, punctual. This means you arrive or you do something at the scheduled time, so it means not late. Thankfully, the contractors are very punctual. They say they'll be here at 9 a.m. and 9 a.m., they're here. They're very punctual. Qualified, qualified. This is when you have the skill, the knowledge, or the ability to do something specific. Ronnie is the most qualified accountant I know. Riveting, riveting. This means extremely interesting. The speakers at the conference were all riveting. Renowned, renowned. This means you're famous for something specific. Maya Angelou is a renowned poet. So she's famous, but for something specific, poetry. She's a renowned poet. Ravishing, ravishing. This means extremely beautiful. You look ravishing in that dress. Or if you're a male, you look ravishing in that suit. Reverent, reverent. This is showing great respect or admiration. The reverent crowd became silent when she appeared on stage. So to show their respect and admiration, the crowd became silent. So we can say they're a reverent crowd. Self-reliant, self-reliant. This means that you rely on your own skills and abilities. When you work remotely, you need to be self-reliant. Sensible, sensible. This means having and using good judgment. I like working with Hamid. He's very sensible. Savvy, savvy. This means you have practical 
knowledge, and skills. She's very savvy when it comes to marketing. And I'm sure you're familiar with the term tech savvy, which means you're very skilled and knowledgeable when it comes to technology, tech savvy. I'm very tech savvy. What about you? Are you tech savvy? Put that in the comments. I'm tech savvy. I'm not tech savvy. Supportive, supportive. This is giving encouragement and approval. As a teacher, I try to be very supportive to all my students. Sincere, sincere. This means honest, not false, not invented. Her apology was sincere. So she said, I'm sorry, and she said it in an honest way, not I'm sorry, where clearly she's not actually sorry. I'm sorry. Her apology was sincere. Straightforward, straightforward. This means honest and not hiding one's opinions. I love how straightforward Shirley is. Sage, sage. This means wise, and we use it specifically with people who are wise because they're old. And with their old age, they gain wisdom. They're very sage. The consultant has 20 years of experience, so we can trust his sage advice. Steadfast, steadfast. This means staying the same for a long time, not changing, not losing purpose. Jose is a steadfast assistant. Tenacious, tenacious. This is when you're unwilling to accept defeat or unwilling to stop doing or having something. Felicity is a tenacious student. Thrilling, thrilling. This means very exciting. Fabio's plan for the company is thrilling. Tender, tender. This means gentle, loving, or kind. It's important to be tender when you're delivering bad news. Tactful, tactful. This is when you're careful not to say or do something that could upset others. Yusuf quit in a very tactful way. Upbeat, upbeat. This means positive with hope for the future. Marie is very upbeat about the proposal. Unrelenting, I like this one, unrelenting. This means extremely determined, never weakening or ending. I appreciate my parents' unrelenting support. Their support never weakens, it never ends, it's unrelenting. Versatile, versatile. This is when you're able to change easily from one activity to another, or when you can use one thing in many different ways. Brad Pitt is a versatile actor. So he's one actor, but you can use him in many different ways. Romance, comedy, action, drama. He's a versatile actor. Vibrant, vibrant. This means energetic, exciting, and full of enthusiasm. I love how vibrant my work environment is. Witty, witty. When someone's witty, it means they're funny, but in a very intelligent way. My pilot was very witty. Youthful, youthful. This means having qualities that are typical of young people. Her youthful enthusiasm makes coming to work more enjoyable. So maybe she isn't youthful, maybe she is 50 or 60 years old, but her enthusiasm, her energy is youthful, which is a very positive thing. So it's more enjoyable coming to work. Zealous, zealous. This means enthusiastic and eager. I appreciate how zealous she is. You're doing amazing. Now you're going to learn 100 idioms. Adding idioms to your speech are so important because native speakers use idioms all the time. So understanding idioms will help you improve your listening skills and using idioms will help you sound more natural and more advanced. So now let's learn 100 idioms. 
to play something by ear. This is when you make a decision in the moment rather than planning in advance. So let's say you're talking about your weekend and your husband or your friend says, what do you want to do this weekend? And you might say, let's play it by ear. Let's decide as the weekend happens, not in advance. Let's play it by ear. To be all ears. We use this to say that you're ready to listen and you're paying full attention. So let's say you tell your boss you want to discuss something important about the project and your boss replies, I'm all ears, I'm all ears. To wake up on the wrong side of the bed. This is a great one. We've all done this is when you wake up in a bad mood, you wake up grumpy. So let's say you wake up, you go in the kitchen and your wife, your husband says, oh, hi, honey, how are you? Would you like some coffee? What do you want for breakfast? And you're grumpy, uh, I don't care, uh, where's my phone? And you're being grumpy, well then your wife, your husband can say, well, someone woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And that's just to let you know you're being grumpy. To wing something. When you wing something, you perform a speech or presentation without planning in advance. So you definitely don't want to wing your IELTS exam, right? To make a mountain out of a molehill. A molehill is really small, a mountain is really big. So it's when you take a minor problem or issue and you make it seem really serious or severe. So let's say you got one question wrong on a test and you're acting like it's extremely serious. Someone could say, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. They're letting you know it's really not that bad. To be at a crossroads. This is when you have to make a really important decision that could impact your life. Let's say you've been a graphic designer for 10 years, but you're considering going back to school and changing careers and becoming a lawyer or a teacher. So you might say, I'm not sure if I want to be a graphic designer anymore. I'm at a crossroads because that decision will impact your life. To rain cats and dogs, this is when it rains heavily. So let's say your friend in a different city asks you, oh, did it rain last night? And it did, it rained heavily. You can say, yeah, it rained cats and dogs. To be on top of the world, this is when you're really, really happy. So let's say you got a new promotion, you can say, I'm on top of the world. To give someone the cold shoulder. This is when you ignore someone and you ignore someone on purpose, usually because you're mad at them, annoyed with them, they did something wrong or something to irritate you. So let's say your husband or your wife is ignoring you. You might say, why are you giving me the cold shoulder? It's another way of asking, why are you mad at me? What did I do wrong? Why are you giving me the cold shoulder? To sit on the fence. This is when you delay making a decision, usually because that decision is difficult and you don't want to make it. For example, I asked my boss for a promotion, but he's sitting on the fence. So he won't answer me. He won't say yes, he won't say no. He keeps just saying, oh, I need to think about it. I'll get back to you. He's sitting on the fence. To hit the nail on the head, this is when you accurately explain a problem or a situation. For example, you hit the nail on the head when you said we needed to reduce our costs. So you explain the situation accurately. To be as fit as a fiddle. This simply means you feel great. You have good health, you're in good shape. So maybe you could say, 
since I changed my diet and I'm eating more fruits and vegetables, I feel as fit as a fiddle. This is a great one. To get something out of your system. This is when you do something or you try something simply so you can move on. For example, let's say you've been talking about going skydiving for years and years. You research it, you look at different websites, you talk to people about it, but you've never actually done it. Someone might say, just go skydiving so you can get it out of your system. So once you do it, you can stop researching it, stop looking it up and just move on already. I like this one. Speak of the devil. Speak of the devil. This sounds negative because of devil, but it's not at all. This is used when you're talking about someone and they appear exactly as you're talking about them. This has happened, right? Let's say you're talking to a friend about your mutual friend, Bob, and you're talking about Bob. Oh, is Bob going to come to the party? Oh, I'm not sure, I haven't talked to Bob. And then your phone rings and guess what? It's Bob. And then you can say, speak of the devil. To give someone the benefit of the doubt, this is when you trust someone when they tell you something. So if a coworker's late and they call you and they say, I'm stuck in traffic, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's trust that he's actually stuck in traffic. No pain, no gain. This is a classic one. This is used to say that if you want results, real results, you have to be willing to work hard and get uncomfortable. So I might say, if you want to improve your public speaking skills, no pain, no gain. You have to be willing to get uncomfortable. Hang in there. This is a great one. It simply means don't give up. I know learning a language is hard, but hang in there. A penny for your thoughts? This is used to ask someone what they're thinking. So let's say your friend is just staring out the window and you probably are wondering, what are they thinking about? You can turn to your friend and say, a penny for your thoughts? It's not rocket science. Rocket science is complicated, right? But if we say it's not rocket science, this means it's not complicated. So I could say becoming a confident English speaker is not rocket science. It's not complicated. You just have to practice speaking. To let someone off the hook. This is a great one because it means that you don't punish someone for a mistake or a wrongdoing. So your boss could say, I know you came in late today, but I'm going to let you off the hook. I'm not going to punish you. To make a long story short, this is when you take a long and usually complicated story and you make it very simple by sharing it briefly. So you could say, long story short, we missed our flight. So there's a long story about why you missed your flight, but you don't explain those details. You just say, long story short, we missed our flight. Easy does it, easy does it. This is a way of saying slow down. So if your friend is at the gym and they're trying to do too many exercises with too much weight, you might say, easy does it, slow down. To go back to the drawing board. This is when you need to start over and create a new plan or strategy because the first one failed. So let's say you were trying to solve a computer problem, you came up with a strategy, it didn't work, and then you can say to your team, well, let's go back to the drawing board and try again. Once in a blue moon. This is an event that happens infrequently. For example, I only see Kara once in a blue moon, not very often. At the drop of a hat. 
This is a great one because it means without hesitation or instantly. For example, call me if you need anything and I'll be there at the drop of a hat. It means I'll come instantly if you need anything. So it's a really nice reassuring thing to say to someone. To add insult to injury. This is when you take a bad situation and it becomes even worse. So let's say you're going out on a first date and your date showed up late. That's already a bad situation. But then to add insult to injury, your date forgot his wallet and you had to pay for both of you. To hit the sack, this means to go to bed. For example, I'm really tired, I'm going to hit the sack. The ball's in your court. This is used when you need to make the next decision or the next step. So I might say, we offered her a great promotion, so now the ball's in her court. So it's up to her to decide if she's going to accept the promotion or look for another job or do something else. To be or to go barking up the wrong tree. This is when you look in the wrong place or you accuse the wrong person. For example, if you think I lost your ring, you're barking up the wrong tree. You're accusing the wrong person. To get or to have your ducks in a row. This is when you're well prepared or well organized for something specific. So you might say, the conference was supposed to start 10 minutes ago. They should have gotten their ducks in a row. They should have been organized or prepared. To get or have the best of both worlds. This is when you enjoy the advantages of two very different things at the same time. She works in the city, but she lives in the country she gets the best of both worlds. The lion's share. This is the largest part or most of something. So you might complain, I did the lion's share of work on this project. To be on the ball. This is when you're performing really well. Wow, you completed all those reports already? You're on the ball. To pull someone's leg. This is when you're joking with someone. So we usually use this to reassure someone you're only joking. Don't get upset, I'm just pulling your leg. To pull yourself together. This is when you need to calm down. You regain your composure after being really upset or agitated, angry, annoyed, and then you calm down. So I might say, pull yourself together. It was a false alarm. So the alarm made you really agitated and I'm telling you to calm down. So far, so good. This is how you reply when you want to let someone know that everything is okay until now. How's the project going? So far, so good. To be the last straw. This is when you have no patience left for someone's errors or mistakes. So I might say, this is her fifth time being late this month. That's the last straw. No more patience for her mistakes. Time flies when you're having fun. This is used to say that you don't notice how long something takes because it's enjoyable. So you might look at your watch and say, oh wow, it's 1 a.m. already? And then someone could reply and say, yeah, time flies when you're having fun. To be bent out of shape, this is used to say you're upset, you're angry. For example, Janice is bent out of shape because she has to work late tonight. To make matters worse, Matters in this sense means problems, to make problems worse. So I might say, I have to work tonight and to make matters worse, to make that situation even worse, 
I have an early appointment tomorrow. Don't judge a book by its cover. You've probably heard this one. It means that you shouldn't judge someone or something on appearance. For example, let's say I'm hiring people and I say I'm not going to hire him. Look at his hair. <laughs> and then my colleague would say, well, don't judge a book by its cover. Look at his resume. To fall between two stools. This is when something fails to achieve two separate objectives. So let's say you plan to watch a romantic comedy movie. That movie is supposed to be romantic and funny at the same time. A romantic comedy, two objectives. So you could say that movie fell between two stools. It wasn't romantic and it wasn't funny. To cost an arm and a leg. This is when something is exceptionally expensive. Now, airline tickets are usually expensive, but exceptionally expensive, even more expensive than usual. I might say my flight cost an arm and a leg. To cross a bridge when you come to it. This is used to remind someone that you only need to deal with the situation when it happens. So your friend might be concerned, what if I forget all my words during my IELTS speaking exam? And then you tell that friend, cross that bridge when you come to it. Worry about that problem when it happens. To cry over spilt milk. This is used when someone complains about a problem or a loss from the past. So let's say I had a party weeks ago and now I'm complaining, I can't believe John didn't come to my party. Well, my friend can say, don't cry over spilled milk. It was three weeks ago. Why are you still talking about it? Curiosity killed the cat. This is used to say that being inquisitive or asking a lot of questions can lead to an unpleasant situation. So let's say your husband or wife is planning you a surprise birthday party and you try to ask a lot of questions. What are we doing? Where are we going? Who's coming? Then your husband or wife can say, curiosity killed the cat. Just to remind you, don't ask so many questions. To miss the boat. This is when you lose an opportunity because you were too slow to take action. For example, the application deadline was last week. I missed the boat. To be on fire. This is to perform really well. Wow, your presentation was amazing. You were on fire. To spill the beans, this is when you reveal a secret when you shouldn't have revealed a secret. So let's say you're planning a surprise party for someone and then you tell everyone, don't spill the beans, don't reveal the secret. To be under the weather, this is when you feel unwell, when you feel sick. Oh. I'm a little under the weather today. A blessing in disguise. This is when something, a situation seems bad or unlucky at first, but it results in something positive at a later date. So let's say you get fired from your job. Obviously that seems bad, maybe even unlucky. But later on, you get a job 10 times better. It pays better, you have a better boss, better coworkers, the location is better. Everything about this job is better. You can say, getting fired was a blessing in disguise. My new job is so much better. A dime a dozen. This is used to describe something that is common and not special. So you can say tech startups in Silicon Valley are a dime a dozen. 
They're very common, they're everywhere, and they're not very special. Everyone's a tech startup in Silicon Valley, a dime a dozen. To beat around the bush. This is when you avoid saying what you mean because it's uncomfortable or awkward. So let's say you want to end your romantic relationship with your partner. Your friend could tell you, don't beat around the bush. Be direct and tell that person you want to break up. Better late than never. So let's say you've been working with a company for 10 years and you finally got your first promotion after 10 years and you're telling your friend this and you're a little annoyed because you've been there for 10 years, but your friend could say better late than never to remind you that yes, it took 10 years, but it's better than not having a promotion. Better late than never. To bite the bullet. I love this idiom. This is when you force yourself to do something difficult or unpleasant because it's necessary or inevitable. Inevitable means eventually you have to do it, so why not bite the bullet and do it now? For example, just bite the bullet and ask your boss for a promotion. Break a leg. This is a very common idiom that we use to say good luck. Good luck, break a leg. But we especially use this before someone gives a performance. Most commonly a theatrical performance, but when you're going for a job interview, you are in a sense performing. Or when you're doing your speaking exam for your IELTS, you are performing. So before your speaking exam, your friend, your partner could say, break a leg, which means good luck. To call it a day. When you call it a day, it means you stop working for that day, usually because time is up or because you've done enough work for that day and you're going to stop. For example, it's getting late, let's call it a day. Let's call it a day. So that means you can go home. To cut somebody some slack. So let's say, there's this coworker who has been showing up late to work every day and not doing a very good job at work. They seem very distracted, they're not working very hard, they're not contributing. But that person's dad just died. So you might say, let's cut him some slack. His dad just died. So you're not going to punish him as severely as you normally would. To be glad to see the back of. This means that you're happy that somebody has left because you don't like them. So let's say it's Jane's last day at work. She quit, she has a new job, but you didn't like Jane. You can say, I'm glad to see the back of Jane. To be the best thing since sliced bread. This is a compliment used to say that something, usually technology or an invention, is extremely useful, excellent, or high quality. So you could give me a compliment and say, this YouTube channel is the best thing since sliced bread. If you think that's true, then put it in the comments. There are plenty of fish in the sea. So let's say your friend went on a date and she says, Pierre hasn't called me back and it's been three weeks. You can encourage your friend by saying, don't worry, there are plenty of fish in the sea. Come rain or shine. This is used to say that an event will take place despite external circumstances. So let's say tomorrow is a vacation day for you, 
but there's a big project deadline tomorrow. But you might say, I'm taking the day off tomorrow, come rain or shine, to cut corners. This is when you do something in the cheapest, easiest, or fastest way, but by omitting something or by not following rules. So you might say, we felt pressured to cut corners because of the tight deadline to get your act together. So your parents might say to you or your sibling or someone you know, you're 30 and you still live at home and you don't have a job. You need to get your act together. You need to organize yourself so you can live in, e in an effective and efficient way. Get your act together to break the ice. This is such an important one because this is used to help people who don't know each other to feel more comfortable around each other, especially when they're meeting for the first time. Let's break the ice by introducing ourselves and sharing something interesting about ourselves. Clear as mud. This is used to say that something is very difficult to understand. So if somebody gave you instructions, but their instructions didn't make any sense at all, and they ask you, so is everything okay? Do you understand? You can say clear as mud, which tells the person you do not understand at all. Crystal clear, something is very clear and easy to understand. His instructions were crystal clear. To rock the boat. This is when you do or say something that could upset people or cause problems. Don't rock the boat until the negotiations are done. So don't say anything that could upset someone or that could cause problems until we sign the deal. And then you can cause problems if you want to. To get out of hand, this is another way of saying to get out of control, which means you no longer have control over a situation. You could say the party got out of hand, which means you were no longer able to control it. The party got out of hand and some valuables were broken. A bad apple. This is used to describe a bad or corrupt person within a group. You could say, there are a few bad apples in the company. To cut to the chase. This is when you only talk about the most important points of a subject or topic. So if you're running out of time in, the, in a meeting, you might say, we're running out of time, so I'll cut to the chase. I'll only say the most important points. To come in handy. This is used when something is very useful for a specific purpose. So if it's pouring rain outside, you might say an umbrella would come in handy. An umbrella would be very useful in this particular situation. To reinvent the wheel. This is when you waste time trying to recreate something that somebody else has already created. So let's say you ask your boss, should I create a presentation for the conference? And your boss suggests using last year's presentation. It's already created. And your boss can add, don't reinvent the wheel. So we often use this idiom in the negative. To go with the flow. When you go with the flow, it means that you do what other people are doing, or you agree with the opinion of others, the majority. So let's say you're having a company dinner and you originally wanted to have burgers, but the majority of people say they want pizza. So you can go with the flow and have pizza instead of burgers because that's what the majority wants. To be skating on thin ice. 
This is when you do something that is dangerous or involves risk. He's skating on thin ice by lying to his wife. It involves risk. It's dangerous. Don't do it. A silver lining. This is something positive that comes from something negative. So the pandemic is negative, right? But is there anything positive, a silver lining? Maybe we could say one silver lining of the pandemic is that it made us realize how important our relationships are with friends and family. To have a sweet tooth. This is somebody who likes eating sweet foods, especially chocolate. So if people offer me dessert, generally I'll say no because I don't like sweet food. So I could say, no thank you, I don't have a sweet tooth, which means I don't really like sweet foods. To go Dutch. This is when you agree to share the cost of something, especially a meal. So let's say you're having dinner with a friend, family member, even a romantic partner, and they say, I'll pay for the meal. You could say, no, 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 let's go Dutch, which means you're going to divide the cost 50-50. To make ends meet. This is when you have just enough money to pay for essential items. You might say, with food prices increasing, we're barely making ends meet. To ring a bell. This is when something, usually a person, a place, or information is familiar to you. So let's say you're having a conversation with a coworker and they say, oh, have you met Fred from accounting? And you're thinking, Fred, Fred, Fred from accounting? That doesn't ring a bell. The tip of the iceberg. This is used to describe a small part of a much bigger problem. These small local protests are just the tip of the iceberg to blow off steam. This is when you say or do something that helps you release strong feelings or strong energy, strong emotion. After our fight, I went for a walk to blow off steam. So when you were on that walk, you were able to calm down, to release that negative energy. A piece of cake. This is something that was extremely easy. That exam was a piece of cake. To be out of the woods. This is when you no longer have a problem or difficulty. Our profits are increasing, but we're not out of the woods yet. To get over something. This is when you recover from an illness. It took me two weeks to get over that cold. To not be one's cup of tea. This is used to describe a type or category that you don't like. Thanks for the invite, but camping isn't my cup of tea. I don't like that category of activity. To be loaded. This means to be rich, to have a lot of money. I just found out my cousin's loaded. To nip something in the bud. This is to stop something before it has an opportunity to become established. We need to nip these rumors in the bud before the employees start worrying. Out of the blue. When something happens out of the blue, it happens suddenly and you weren't expecting it. My boss gave me a promotion out of the blue. You weren't expecting it. How awesome is that? To keep one's chin up. This is to remain cheerful in a difficult situation because in difficult situations, we tend to put our chin down, but when we're happy, we tend to keep our chin up. For example, I know the economy seems bad, but keep your chin up. To race against the clock. This is when you try to finish a task quickly 
before a specific time. I raced against the clock to finish the audit and meet the deadline. To catch somebody off guard. This is when you surprise somebody by doing something they weren't expecting or weren't prepared for. The politician was caught off guard when asked about the scandal. To be on one's radar. If something is on your radar, it means you're considering it or thinking about it or aware of it. You could say leaving the company isn't on my radar. It's not even something I'm considering. To stab someone in the back. This is to betray someone. To do something harmful to someone who trusted you. She told the client she did all the work on the project. I can't believe she stabbed me in the back like that. To make a beeline for something. This is when you move quickly and directly towards something. So let's say you're at a wedding or a conference and they're about to serve lunch, the buffet lunch. Everyone made a beeline for the food. They went quickly and directly to the food. To be in hot water. This is when you're in a situation where you might be criticized or punished. The politician's in hot water after his comments on gender equality. To be dressed to the nines. This is when you're dressed formally, smartly, or fashionably. We dress to the nines for our wedding anniversary. So you usually dress to the nines for a special occasion. To be between a rock and a hard place. This is when you're in a difficult situation or you have to make a difficult decision. If I accept the promotion, then I'll have to move abroad and I know Matt, my partner, won't come with me. So I either accept the promotion that I really want, but then I have to lose Matt, or I stay with Matt and I don't get the promotion. Hmm. I'm between a rock and a hard place. It's a difficult situation. It's a difficult decision. Lo and behold, this is an expression used to say that something surprising happened. I was on vacation in Japan and lo and behold, I saw my childhood sweetheart. So it's very surprising that I see my childhood sweetheart across the world in a foreign city, lo and behold. And finally, to let the cat out of the bag. This is when you accidentally reveal a secret. So let's say you're planning a surprise party for your wife or husband or friend and they know about it. You might say, you know about the party, don't you? Who let the cat out of the bag? Who told you? Who revealed the secret? Who let the cat out of the bag? You did it! Amazing job! You now have 300 advanced English words added to your vocabulary. Woohoo! Do you want to keep learning more advanced English words and English vocabulary? If so, put more, more, more in the comments below. And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. And why don't you get started with your next lesson right now?